A good Monday morning to you on this May 10th, and welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you alongside producer Sarah Hoyles, the show's, te- the show's technical producer, uh, Samuel Brooks. How are the two of you doing this morning? You doing all right? You guys have a good yeah. weekend? I had a great weekend. Everybody feeling good? Sarah, yeah. you feeling good? Everybody, Let's do it. What's everyone going to say? We, every, no, it was, it was, yeah. Everyone's going to be like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we'll get into our weekends in just a second. <laughs> we want to remind you that this show is presented each and every morning by the team at Bitcoin Well. And of course, crypto is going nuts right now. I know everybody's paying attention to it, especially following uh, Saturday Night Live on, uh, you know, Elon Musk, the host of Saturday Night Live, of course. Um, you know, everybody's talking about Dogecoin. Everybody's uh, wondering what was going on with that. And, of course, the big explosion uh, on the value there. You, you got questions about Dogecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever. The team at Bitcoin Well is a great place to start. It's where I go with my questions. And uh, so far, they're batting a 1,000. I'm not saying I understand everything, but they're at least able to dumb it down enough that I can start to make sense of it. You can find Bitcoin Well under the Sponsors tab, right at the top of the page at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. So you had uh, Elon Musk on Saturday Night Live, which I know that uh, Sarah Hoyle said, like, you had PVR'd it, you set your alarm... Uh, oh, you, you know it. You were there. You you watched it, and then you probably watched it again. I live is that tweeted right? it. Is that yeah. right? Western Canada's largest Elon Musk fan. Is that is that the vibe I'm picking? Am I right on that? I would say that, but the complete opposite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is it about the uh, what is it about the the head honcho at Tesla and uh, SpaceX that rubs you the wrong way? You you didn't watch. Uh, would let me start with this. Would you normally watch SNL? Uh, if there's like a really great guest that I want to see, or I'll like probably like a lot of people, I, you know, will watch the snippets yeah. afterwards and like get caught up on because they do a lot of bits. Right. And so they're not they're not all home runs. Fair, <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair. So, so, so you're not but you're not inherently anti SNL. No, for you. But heavens no. But you you intentionally did not watch this weekend. Because Elon Musk was hosting, is that right? Absolutely. I mean, he's. I I question like I mean I get why they would have him on because he's a big name and he's you know he he grabs a lot of attention. Yeah. But does he grab that attention for all the right reasons? I would say no. He's a union buster. Where the folks that are at Tesla, his company. Yeah. I mean, he also is doing SpaceX. And he has oodles. He got so much richer amidst the pandemic and he's not willing to, you know, pass those. They always talk about, you know, trickle down economics and 
uh, he's not passing on his windfall. Whoever, who, nobody in, in with, nobody with a serious or straight face talks about trickle down economics. Well, absolutely, yeah. but I mean that's what previous American uh, administrations definitely believed that if we give tax breaks to big corporations, that it will trickle down. Yeah, I, I'm I'm actually just reading about this. I'm I when you were talking about union bust, I'm like really. Uh, oh yeah. I don't, they're, they're, have you ever find that there's so many things going on, like just in life, in the world, and you think you're so in tune to everything, and you think you're paying attention, you think you know, not you don't <laughs> think you know all about everything. But let me stop. I myself. don't. Maybe let you me do. stop <laughs> myself before I before I complete that sentence. But you know, usually if somebody was like, uh, you know, how about Shit's Creek? You'd be like, yeah, hey, big year. Look at all the Emmys. Or if somebody was like, how about Connor McDavid? You'd be like, wow, 100 points and 53. We just kind of like know generally yeah, what's going on. Yeah, like yeah. it's in the... When I think of Elon Musk, I think of like, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're getting more and more ambitious with the rocket game, you know, this, that, and the other. But I, I wasn't familiar with the union stuff, so that's interesting. When you say he's a union buster, he's also many other things. Um, he you is. know, he's also the guy that might sort of be the most forward thinking human on planet Earth with regards to what our future looks like and where we might go and what exploration might look like. I suppose so. But maybe I'm I just I don't think that we have any business going into space right now. What? We have no business. We can't get it right on Earth. What the heck are That's we trying to... That's even more reason to go to space. No, but who will go to space? The people that can afford it. So all the people that are exploitative here are just going to take their exploitation Wouldn't that elsewhere. be great? Get rid of them? Get them off the face have of the Earth? Have you not read Wouldn't any that be Dr. Positive? Seuss? Wouldn't like... that be great? <laughs> Sam, I don't think in the six months we've been hanging out, I don't think that you and I have ever discussed elon musk i have i learned really? ab about sarah today she's not a huge fan i had no i, I have no idea where you're going to land on this I, I, I think I'm, I'm trying to brag about sarah on this one. i don't think we have your mic sam I don't think we have no, no I'm, uh, I'm there we go simultaneously trying to get our guests set up and doing all this here and i click elon like, musk elon musk uh kind of a jerk face um Built, built a built an impressive company. I think that we can we can marvel at his commitment to new technology, and I think he's definitely uh, inspired some people to pull the world in in the right direction. Yeah. But I think we can also separate that from the fact that he is a terrible human being. I mean, I say the same thing about Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos, both awful, awful human beings, even though they did great things. Interesting. Interesting. You didn't expect those. Uh, well, I, I'm not surprised to hear that. I, I know that, like, you know, for example, because we're such polite Canadians, um, that, that people might say, well, he's not my cup of tea, as an example. <laughs> uh, but, uh, like, I'm, I'm curious. To, I'm, I'm dropping in right now. I'm loading it as we speak. I got to drop it on the live chat to see how. By the way, Jeff's making his debut before. Uh, Jay, before he says, I've listened many times, but this is my first time logging on to YouTube for the show. Jeff Spilger, uh, or Spilger. Jeff, let's all extend a very warm welcome to Jeff, who is making his his live audience debut this morning. A shout out to you, Jeff. See, that doesn't happen. You don't get a shout out from the host if you're just listening to the podcast later. It doesn't work like that. Some random guy thrilled at getting the vaccine today. Pretty exciting there. Let's get to the Elon Musk comments here. Let's see how people feel. Right around the time I mentioned that, I would imagine people... Emma says, I bought Ethereum two weeks ago. It's up 71%. It's wild. Ethereum is going nuts right now when it comes to crypto. Um, but okay, so where are we? Yeah, uh, Robert says, hot take. Elon was not good on SNL. Um, Kim says, I've watched very few episodes. I watch most live, but says I'm missing that most SNL right now. Ryan says, the cold opening was nicely done. Miley Cyrus opened the show and was just absolutely incredible. I look at Miley Cyrus uh, and the the like the way that she sings... I see her as as like she's one of those. I mean, I, I'm not the first to say this. I'm not pretending like this is profound. But every time she sings, I feel like it's it's like we're hearing a, a sort of a generational type talent. You know what I mean? Mm. Like like when you when you think you think of like sort of female vocal powerhouses through the years, and I feel like she, to me she's still. Can you still be hitting your stride when when you're when you're the star and, and I mean she's like a, she's just a shooting star she's yeah. had so much success but I still feel like she's she's got a lot of runway. I, Every time I hear it, it's this is where I will actually agree with you, Ryan. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I think I mean she is still quite young, and uh, if you look at you know Madonna's career or Cher's career, they they have 
you know, every every so many years they reinvent themselves. So yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, Miley seems to be doing the same thing. And she's, yeah, got heaps and heaps of talent. Amazing. I think, like, I'm not comparing the voices necessarily, but you kind of had this Stevie Nicks vibe going on when she was singing this Mother's Day song. It was just, it was really great, really cool. Um, uh, Air I said, Straya says he was claiming... Uh, that he was the first person with Asperger's to host SNL. Uh, Eri said, Straya says two words for you, boyo. Dan Aykroyd. Does, does Dan Aykroyd? Yeah. Your mic's, your mic's uh, we don't have your mic, Sam. I don't know. It's okay. No, it's it's okay. It's uh, it's been a lot of stuff over here. I was going to say Dan Aykroyd actually threw some shade at Elon Musk afterwards. Did he? Yeah. When After Elon Musk came weekend? out and said that, Dan Aykroyd was like, hey, it, like over here. Hmm. But that just, I think, goes to show how Elon Musk is just so self-centered and just so in his own world. But maybe, but maybe, I mean, you know, oh man, I'm I, I don't I'm not going to become the guy. I don't know enough about Elon Musk to be the guy that's going to sit and defend Elon Musk. Um, I there's a lot of people like this guy. Well, I but I, why are why are like yeah, he might he so might save the planet like I, you know what I always look at w when people will say what's a good example I'm trying to think of a good example like uh, okay because I want I, because I desperately want to segue this into hockey um, well I know that we also have a Canadian senator and a member of parliament waiting for us to get the segment going they're like any time now like our, yeah. our morning our time is valuable anytime you're done with your ruminations out of the weekend. <laughs> But I think of in, in certain sports or certain cultures, like in the culture of sport, people people don't like celebration or people take issue with sort of a, a, a bombastic or flamboyant type of person. It could be a celebrity. It could be an author. It could be something that's just a little bit different. And, and I think of this former number one overall pick just happened to go to the Edmonton Oilers, a kid out of the Sarnia Sting uh, by the name of Nail Yakupov, who scored a big goal and channeled his inner Theron Flurry and went racing across the ice, dropped to his knees and went sliding on his knees for this like iconic goal celebration. And everybody was like, ah, like cracking on Yakupov and they gave no respect for the game and the people that came before him. No humility. No, you know, so, so sort of this sort of a thing where people just really uh people really um kind of they have no tolerance for like the individuality and and i think oftentimes if you look at someone like that and i could use a thousand different examples i think that their their quirkiness or their the unique nature of the way that their mind works or their 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 um let me say a lack of self-doubt <laughs> or at least what might be perceived as a lack of self-doubt is what fuels them and drives them. And that's the X factor that makes them different. And that's why they achieve like what's Elon Musk worth something like a hundred. I mean, he's like over a hundred billion dollars His net worth over a hundred billion dollars. He thinks like in these wild, like he seems to me to be the guy that would never think why not. I mean, he would think why not? He would, he would, he wouldn't be hampered down by why you should not do something. He, he like go to Mars. Sure. Right. B you know, run cars on, uh, you know, pure electricity. No, gas. sure. Uh, and, and maybe that maybe it rubs some people the wrong way. But, but I, like, I just want to point to the fact that I, like, I do not deny that he is an innovator and he thinks in really imaginative ways. I'm yeah. not I'm not diminishing that. Yeah. It's about where do you place that? And I'm, again, to put somebody up on a pedestal because they're rich is to no, me, not, no, 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 no. But like That's to to uh, like accrue so much wealth, I'm mm -hmm. just kind of like, yeah. But that like, and he, I mean, he was all for Donald Trump at a certain point. Yeah, he. A lot of people were <laughs> well, right. Well, absolutely, but it's just like he had he should stay in his lane. <laughs> stay in his lane. What's his lane? Well, if he's gonna do electric cars, like do electric cars. Um, and innovate that way. I just don't think that he should be dipping his toes in, in a variety of other things. Uh, yeah, who knows? Th these are all matters of opinion. Uh, the oh, one, 100%. The, the, one, the one thing I think is dangerous is the Dogecoin thing. I think a lot of people could lose a lot of money mm. based on that. And and even in in uh, in Weekend Update where they where Michael Che was, they're pushing him. They did a great job of it. It was really funny. And you could tell that that was kind of set up because everybody knew Elon was going to comment on crypto. At what point would it come? In what form would it come? And uh, and Colin Jost and Michael Che did a really good job with it, I think. And at the end, they're like, oh, so it's a hustle. And he was like, yeah, it's a hustle. And then I was kind of like, ooh, I mean, something like that, a comment like that. And then you saw the could 
right and that's what it did. Down, it went, just went right, <laughs> right. And so for somebody that was expecting it, you know, and this, hey, buyer beware. I mean, all this stuff, buyer beware on all of this stuff. But you just wonder. I, I think it's kind of dangerous. We're going to get to Senator Paul Simon's MP Matt Jenner in just a quick second. Wanted to remind you that rural communities uh, make the most out of less. And affordable housing and homelessness are big issues that we're trying to solve in the big cities. Ever wondered what the solutions might look like in rural communities? From June 1st through 3rd, the Rural Development Network and the Rural Ontario Institute are taking things virtual for the Canadian Rural and Remote Housing and Homelessness Symposium. Expect a unique program, more than 30 workshops and panel sessions with renowned keynote speakers like Indigenous activist Jesse Thistle and AHMA's Executive Director, Margaret Foe. Don't miss your chance to collaborate with housing providers, community leaders, and social innovators to pick up new tools that can lift up entire communities. Now, Real Talk audience members get an exclusive 20% off when you use the code RYAN. And so you can register today at C-R-R-H-H-C-A. That's C-R-R-H-H. .ca. The promo code Ryan gets you 20% off. Well, there's something unique going on in Ottawa. You know, oftentimes uh, Canadians will ask their elected representatives to, to demonstrate that they can cooperate in a bipartisan fashion, that they can work across the aisle, so to speak, and even at different levels, like, for example, in, in the House of Commons, uh, in the Senate. How often do we actually see it play out? Well, the Compassionate Bereavement Bill uh, to extend bereavement time for Canadian employees is an example of, of how this can all happen. And, and it's happening, it's been last week, uh, some time leading up to that and, and into right now, present day. As a matter of fact, we, with our lead off guest this morning, who are going to paint a bit of a, a picture for us, some perspective. It's a real pleasure to welcome back to the show uh, Independent Senator Paula Simons and the Member of Parliament for Edmonton Riverbend, my friend Matt Jenneru. Good morning to both of you, and thanks for being here. Uh, Matt, morning, Matt you're the one, the, the, the private member that sponsored this. Can, can you give us just kind of a, ah, can we call it House of Commons 101, uh, a bit of a background on what a private member's bill looks like and, and what's unusual about this one? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, great to make my official debut on uh, on Real Talk Show. Uh, really looking forward to it. Uh, long time coming. Uh, no, you know this is it, com- coming into the to the House of Commons. Very similar to the provincial legislature. You get a bit of a one on one as a new member on how how private members' bills work, uh, and then you find out very quickly that you go into a bit of a bit of a draw and and how you, everyone's kind of given a slot. My slot was very early on, and uh, I was able able to to uh, get a get a slot that allowed me to bring forward a, a private member's bill and you, then you then learn that it's a, a series of a process that goes from uh, first reading second reading committee third reading and in the house of commons you then have to uh, if you want to pass something you have to go over to the senate uh, to to do that so it's i pass a private member's bill at the provincial legislature which is a very similar process but it you don't have that Senate piece. So that's uh, that's where enter my my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Senator Simons. And, and that's essentially the stage we're at now. So uh, be- before we get to, to Senator Simons, let me l- let uh, us get to a point where we understand why bereavement leave resonated with you, uh, Matt. Like what, what was it? I mean, you get a chance to have a private member's bill. I know for a lot of people it's a huge opportunity because it's your chance to essentially really – I mean, I understand there's probably some mechanics going on behind the scenes here, but really to put something you care about in front of your colleagues. Why was it bereavement leave? Yeah, it's your chance to make a law. It's uh, it's pretty cool and, uh, to be able to do. Uh, so the bereavement leave for for me, it started back when again I was elected at the provincial level, and you know, my my grandma had had passed away a, a few years before, and that caregiver piece and, and compassionate leave was something I really felt that that the province of Alberta was was missing at the time. Uh, brought forward uh, a bill and were able to work through the through those scenarios. You know, my my grandma meant the world to me. Uh, uh, still does. Uh, when she passed away, I, I didn't spend those those extra days with her, and I always regretted it. Uh, regretted to this day that didn't get to to, to spend her last few days with her. Uh, so when it came to to making a law and at the provincial level, you know, it was a, it was a no brainer for me. 
And then I did one term at the federal level. I got uh, a, a very, very low draw in terms of, of where my, my private member's bill was. So I had to, uh, had to, to cross my fingers and, and hope that, uh, you know, getting elected this last time had the opportunity to bring forward something and, and did got a, a high draw, but we're in a minority uh, government right now. So you're never quite sure what's going to happen uh, when we're going to kind of get to the, to the stage of your bill being read. And then you throw on a, you know, a, a proroguing of, of parliament and a, a suspension, uh, so to speak, where again, delayed a lot of things during the pandemic. So we're actually, it's really quite a, a miracle moving at lightning speed pace, if, if, if you, if you can say that in terms of, uh, of legislation. So yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty, uh, pretty excited about uh, the days ahead here. Senator, there's something unique um, about your involvement here, isn't there? But, but in the context of, of, of yourself as an independent senator and, and MP Genereau as an, as an official opposition MP? Yeah, I mean, Matt and I have basically ripped up the rule book and nobody in the Senate knows quite what to do with us. Because what you need to understand is that up until six years ago, the Senate was a, a by you know a, a, a twofold body it had it had conservatives and liberals and a very few independents well since then there have been massive reforms in the senate and now 80 percent of senators are independent there are only 20 conservative senators left and all the rest of us are independents so matt came to me and matt's being unduly modest what he's done is really extraordinary he's put together a coalition in the house of commons he has convinced mps from every single party to support his bill and that's really quite revolutionary and then he came to me and this is a very bold and brave thing he did and he said senator simons would you as an independent senator sponsor my bill and it will be the first time that a member of the independent senators group has sponsored a bill by a member of the opposition so you know, I, I went to my my uh, compatriots in the Senate and said, I would like to sponsor uh, uh, Mr. Jenneru's bill. How do we do that? There are no rules for how an independent senator sponsors a bill from an opposition MP. So we're making it up. Uh, so I will be the sponsor. I have asked another independent senator, Vern White, who is a member of the Canadian Senators Group to serve as the official critic of the bill. And in all honesty, uh, we keep going to the people in the clerk's office and asking, well, you know, what do we do next? How do we do that? And nobody knows. So in patented Paula Simon's fashion, uh, I'm like a bull in a china shop and we're gonna make it up as we go along. And I'm just, you know, I really feel, you know, I started off thinking I would do this as a courtesy to another Edmonton parliamentarian. And now I think that what Matt and I are doing is so important at this time when, frankly, the whole country is in mourning. I mean, bereavement has become so top of mind for so many Canadians. We are all going through such a traumatic year. And I think that if we can say we're putting aside partisan politics, we're putting aside party labels, and we're going to come up with sensible, uh, practical legislation that helps Canadians who are governed uh, by the Canada Labour Code to have a few extra days to grieve when a close family member dies, I, I think that's I think that's really sending a really important signal, not just about the reform of the Senate, but about what we can do when we put labels aside and work on policy that matters. So, Matt, you're I mean, you're working with with Senator Simons. Uh, you've, you've also been doing work across the aisle on this with the governing liberals. Um, what does that say? I mean, I, I think back I mean, again, I, I hesitate to invoke other examples because I, I, I think it could be apples and oranges. But I think of, for example, Wynn's Law, uh, people that are watching this out of Alberta or out of Western Canada will certainly remember the story of of Constable Wynn, who was gunned down in in St. Albert outside the Apex Casino th through the course of his duties. Um, and, uh, and and at that time, the conservatives wanted to put a law that, again, I'm probably going to just stay in the shallow end on this one, essentially that, that would give the courts uh, that would provide more background information in bail hearings. So that's basically they were trying to trying to make it easier and more seamless and, and provide more information so people with long rap sheets uh, wouldn't be put out on bail and, and i'm sure someone would take issue with how i'm characterizing this but that's the basic gist of it you would think well who could possibly disagree with this the fact of the matter is uh, it did not pass and the governing liberals did did not give it the rubber stamp and there was not unanimous cooperation so it doesn't happen all the time 
What does it say to you that this is seeing, I don't know if I can use the word unanimous still, I guess it still remains to be seen, but it's, it's seeing incredible support from different groups, different parties, people of different political persuasions. Yeah, so we'll find out uh, officially on Wednesday is the the vote if we can still use unanimous. Uh, yeah. Fingers crossed, and all all uh, all points to that we we will be able to. Yeah, the so it's an interesting example with with Wins Law. You're right; it had the the support within the House of Commons, but the the nuances that come into play often are, you know, publicly it's you, you, we stand up and we we vote in, in favor of a of a bill. It then goes to to committee, which then gets ripped apart and 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 torn to pieces essentially. And and that's that's where parties seem to to be able to to, to pu- push those lines uh, a little those partisan lines uh, a little bit more, uh, recognizing that uh, Winslow is a you know a, a, I could say a, a great example of that. Um, Michael Cooper, local uh, Edmonton MP, brought that uh, forward. And the, it, as soon as it got to committee, it, uh, it it seemed to be barriers up. So what uh, what we were able to to, to do and, and started working very early on with the the Liberal members of committee, the the Bloc Quebecois members of committee. My my French still isn't as good as I'd like it to be, but it was practicing just to make sure that we could get them uh, them on side. Uh, the NDP members, you know, making sure that uh, that they knew what was coming. There's no surprises there. Want then want to work with them. So it was actually it was an amendment brought forward by. The minister herself uh, that said, you know, what if we, what if we broadened it so it's not just the the caregivers who are protected for for leave, it protects even more people. And you know, it was it was something honestly I'd never thought of, and said, yeah, you know, this does make a, a ton of sense. So I think being able to always kind of be one step ahead was was kind of the strategy that we employed. It's the the same strategy that we're employing in the Senate. Talk to to Paula. I think it's been it's been months now that Paula and I have been talking, and still not in the Senate yet. So want to make sure that that we're we're doing that necessary work so an actual good law will get uh, passed in this country i i saw it i want to reference a news release from a few days ago matt that, that your office uh released where you you describe paula uh as a huge champion for compassionate legislation senator uh I know you won't take issue with that. I was going to ask if it's accurate. I think everybody that pays attention knows. I mean, you conducted yourself in a similar way as, as a journalist and a columnist. What does that mean to you, though, now as as a senator? And, and what does that mean moving forward? You know, as I said, I mean, so many people in this country are grieving right now, whether we've lost family members to COVID or lost family members to the complications created by COVID, the, you know, the lack of access to medical care. And when Matt came to me with this bill, you know, at first I was like, okay, well, he's a conservative. I'm not a conservative. You know, what is this going to look like? What is this going to be like? And I read the bill and I thought, no, this is, this is a bill that I am happy to support because it, it's a first step. And I want to be really clear. This doesn't create extra bereavement leave for every single Canadian. These are for people who work under the Canada labor code. So they are people who work in federated federally regulated industries, banking, transportation, telecommunications, uh, media, uh, and a variety of other ones that are under federal regulation. But it's a really important first step. And it sends a signal to all kinds of public and private sector employers that this is a step that we want to take as a country. So I was very excited when Matt approached me with this project. Now, the challenge is that the Senate has been sitting on a very irregular schedule because of COVID-19 and because of the politics of Ottawa. And so the real challenge for me uh, is to, you know, when Matt hands me the baton, is to try to get this, I'm going to mangle my sports metaphor, he's going to pass me the baton and I'm going to get the ball as far up the field as I can. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do No, we should just stick with hockey metaphors. Uh, uh, he's going to pass me the puck and I'm going to try to put it in the net. You're going to put it top shelf. Yeah. There are going to be a lot of people between me and the net. And it's not that people in the Senate are going to oppose this on policy, but the Senate is a funny place. It's a bit like kabuki theater. Things are quite ritualized. Things happen at the pace that they happen. And it is not a quick pace. And I don't know what's going to happen when we upset the apple cart this way, because I've been trying to build uh, uh, consensus in the Senate to support this bill. But because of the very peculiar way we're doing it, you know, a a private member's bill from a member of the opposition being sponsored by a non-conservative at a time when everybody in Ottawa is talking about an election, uh, 
I don't know what kind of political hurdles I'm going to face, but I'm not very good at subtlety. I never have been. And so I'm just going to push as hard as I can to, you know, to put the puck in the net. Who needs subtlety anyway? Uh, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, that both of you have hard outs. Your, your, your days, uh, obviously well into it. And, and we sure appreciate your time. Uh, MP Jenner, let me ask you this in closing. Um, c- can you see more of this coming about in, in the context of legislation that, that may be a direct or indirect result of, of what we learned through COVID-19? I don't expect you to say that the official opposition loves the liberal budget. I don't expect you to say that you think the prime minister is a great leader. I don't expect you to say anything like that. But when we're having bigger conversations around things like universal basic income or federally subsidized child care or a national pharma care program or bereavement leave or many of the other things that could come as a result of this national conversation, can you see more bipartisan cooperation or do you think this might be an outlier? You know, I, I really hope so. I, I think in from my perspective, the, the, the pandemic really has changed a, a lot of just that, you know, seeing each other human to human, you know, the, the, the number of, of liberal MPs that I text on a regular basis now has certainly gone up. A uh, number of NDP MPs I text on a regular basis have certainly gone up. I think I think the long term legacy, and this will just, you know, be a small little piece of, of that, is the the, the ability to for for us as as politicians as as lawmakers to say you know we need to 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 do better people look at Ottawa they look at the Alberta legislature and say all we see is is bickering all the time I hope that that the small little piece that this does is inspires probably that you know that that young activist that that young person who wants to get involved in politics and and sees you know i don't have to go in there and and yell and scream and 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 be aligned with my particular party on every single issue all the time i hope that it really does open uh, open people's eyes to you know good legislation can happen if uh, if you reach across the aisle and this is this will just be hopefully one example maybe the first example of that there you have it interesting when 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 this bill was up for debate in the commons a couple of weeks ago Anthony Housefather, who is the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Labor, said in debate that, that this process had restored his faith in, in you know, Canada's democratic process. I really hope that I can restore people's faith in the Senate by demonstrating that as an independent senator, because Ryan, you keep saying bipartisan, but I'm not a liberal. Yeah. I'm not an, I'm not a new Democrat. I mean, Fair. I'm an independent senator. And I want people to see how the independent reformed Senate can function to take good legislation and take the pickle label off the jar and say, this is good legislation. It was brought to us by a private member who happens to be a conservative, who happens to be from my hometown of Edmonton. And I, as an independent senator, am... I'm really honored to be putting my shoulder to the wheel to get this legislation passed. Now I'm hungry and all I can think about is pickles, but I, it's too early in the morning for pickles, Ryan Jesperson. Well, I don't know if it's ever too early for pickles. That's, that's always my thing. And I, and there's like that real, like sort of garlic. If you get like a great, like a crunchy (laughs) kosher dill in the great, that if I'm ever, (laughs) let me tell you, I'm using this as a tool, Paula, because I'm trying to get, I've I've put on like at least 15 pounds through the course of the pandemic. It's fine. I'm happy about it. I wouldn't change a thing, but um, I've got a sweet tooth, and if I ever need to kill the sweet tooth, I'm standing in front of the fridge. A bite into a pickle does it. There's something about the brine. It just I can't think about chocolate anymore. So it's you know they're a great tool. Uh, I digress. <laughs> On our uh, live chat, Judy says Alberta is proud of Senator Simons. Jacqueline says Matt is my representative in South Edmonton, and I appreciate his mailed updates and all his hard work. So look at that. Hey, a spirit of respect in the live chat today too. The friendliest place in the entire internet. Nothing. <laughs> the Senate the Senate is a bit strangely like high school sometimes. And I sort of feel like this is the scene in the high school coming of age story or movie where the cool football jock comes and sits down next to the nerdy little debate student. And so this is this is the moment, right? Like we, we, we've shattered all of the hierarchies of the way the high school is supposed to work. Uh, you know, Matt's come and, and sat down at my table and together. So I'm, I'm Freddie Prinze Jr. in this analogy. Great reference. Yeah, this. great reference. Uh, OK, but I, I the funny thing is, like, we don't have to go, but you're teams are telling us that you do have to go so i better let you go or we're not going to get interviews with either of you again matt jenneru is the mp out of edmonton riverbend official opposition conservative party of canada of course senator paula simons an independent senator from alberta thanks to the both of you and have a great week appreciate it
Take care, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, Paul's absolutely right about about uh, no no affiliation in the Senate as an independent senator, and you're seeing a trend toward more and more of that. Maybe not as fast as as some people might like. Uh, on the bipartisan front, it's been interesting to see. I mean, for example, um, MP Jenneru Matt there was able to work out a very rare trade. Uh, with a liberal member of parliament to have an earlier debate on the bill. This is being prioritized by parliamentarians regardless of party, which I think says a lot. And as you heard from Matt, uh, the vote there on Wednesday. So we'll keep you updated. Sarah will keep us updated on that uh, through the course of this week. Uh, We're going to get to some of the other stories making news. We'll take a look at the results of our Y Station question of the week. While we're talking about politics, uh, we asked you last week how you feel about money in politics. Everything from campaign finances to donations to so-called dark money in politics. And, uh, well, hundreds of you chimed in on it. Some pretty interesting trends. We want to quickly remind you that we're so proud here at Real Talk uh, to be the presenting sponsors of the Global Visions film series at this year's Northwest Fest International Documentary Festival. It's underway right now, and you can check it out online. I encourage you to do so at northwestfest.ca. We had such a great conversation last week with the filmmakers behind Vinyl Nation talking about the resurgence of records. Coming up on Wednesday of this week here on Real Talk, we'll talk to the team behind White Noise, the definitive explosive chronicle of the rise of the alt-right as told by its most high-profile figures. You won't want to miss that Wednesday morning. A reminder, more than 40 feature films plus 40 short films available for viewing right now through till May 16th anytime because they're on demand. Again, at northwestfest.ca, it is Canada's longest-running non-fiction film festival, and we're proud to be partnering with them. Also, a big shout-out this morning to the team at Eden Landscaping. You know, people have been staring. You've been maybe staring at your yards all winter into the spring. If you're like me, you're looking out right now, and it, it, it's not at its sexiest, If and that's being generous. The team at Eden Landscaping is in the business of turning dreams into reality. It all starts with a consultation. They can do it over Zoom. You know, you take a look at the property and start brainstorming. You let them know the budget, and then that's when their 20 years of experience come into the mix. You can check out some of the work that they've done at landscapeedmonton.ca. Really amazing, whether it's adding vegetable garden boxes or, or maybe more shrubbery, even intricate brick work. Hey, maybe a new fire pit. Check it all out at Eden Landscaping, landscapeedmonton.ca. We've been keeping an eye on our uh, live chat this morning, and, and, and the conversation continued around Elon Musk. Of course, he, he uh, hosted Saturday Night Live over the weekend. I, I took a quick look at it. I uh, watched about half of it, I would say. I never miss weekend update. That's one of my favorite 10 minutes of the entire week. Um, the chem dog's pointing out with regards to Elon Musk off camera. Didn't, didn't he also say some pretty disparaging things about a rescue worker? Remember that? His plan to, to build an underwater rescue device to, to try to rescue all of those 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 guys that were trapped in the cave. Didn't that happen? Yeah, I seem to remember a vague memory of that. Vague memory of that. Meantime, Jonathan says, hey, without people, though, like Elon Musk or, or Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos, we wouldn't have mo- many of the things we love. Innovation through technology, like Tesla, Pixar, would be so behind. And then Jonathan invokes the memory of the Avro Arrow, the great Canadian aircraft, the jet that was never really built really says we could it could have launched canada into a flight powerhouse and if not them it'd be somebody else it's the the ugly part says jonathan of innovation you can't do it without money that's an interesting comment too um i also noticed that kelly chimed in kelly says i've got to push back hard on jesperson's stance on elon musk i don't know if i have a stance on elon musk um she says anyway she says outside of spacex most of what he's known for are companies he bought his way into, and the money he got to buy his way in is blood money. His family wealth comes from apartheid-era emerald mines. That from Kelly. Interesting. i got to do some more reading on Elon Musk, I guess. Yeah, very complex individual. I think uh, to that point, I mean, he does mirror a lot of folks that, unlike, I guess, um, what is his name? Not Steve Jobs, although Steve Jobs was self-made. Bill Gates? Bill Gates. What's the other guy? Uh, Mark Bezos, Zuckerberg, Bezos, Jeff Bezos. Bezos. Yeah. yeah. So Bezos like built himself up, but out of a garage. Yes. So like 
I I appreciate that, but I mean, Elon Musk had a way mega head start. Sure, and, just and, like and lots Trump of people did. do, and lots of people do. Yeah, yeah, lots of people have have, have head starts. Um, it's uh, yeah, the whole Jeff Bezos thing. <laughs> this, oh boy, this, this is I know, right? <laughs> Oh, like boy. where do you want to uh, like where do you want to uh, where do you want to start with that? But but I will say that um, you know I <laughs> if you've worked in the service industry, if you've ever been a server, if you've been a bartender, you know that oftentimes the richest people are the worst tippers. That is that is very often the case. Yes. And I remember somebody said to me once like. Well, he didn't get to become a billionaire by giving away his money to everybody. This is not justification for not paying workers fairly. This is not justification for trying to stamp out unions or to crush people or, or force people to work through the pandemic when they don't feel safe or any of these things. Um, but it is kind of an interesting peek into like my my version of like if I signed a pro sports contract or if I came into a bunch of money, one of the great joys of my life would be to drop enormous tips on people like, I would, like without being a jerk about it but i would that would be one of life's great joys and that's not to say these people don't but oftentimes it is the wealthiest people that maybe are a little bit more frugal shall we say or keep the purse tight-fisted? strings a little bit t- tight-fisted might mm-hmm. be a fair way to put it yeah i'm curious to see what comes of elon musk's legacy like what what will it all become mm-hmm. like how big will tesla become or or with regards to to Electric vehicles, EVs, they're not going away. They're only growing in prominence. I mean, soon, with regards to soon, I'm saying like in the next 25 years, I would say, they will probably be the more prominent with regards to fossil fuel powered versus EV, do you think? Maybe? I don't know. I think it's going I, that way. Absolutely. I, I wonder mean, if Tesla keeps its market share there. That's an interesting That's an interesting question. I mean, looking at their price point, they are astronomical price-wise. Well, you can get into a Tesla for like 40 Gs. Okay, but who is going to be able to like, but if you look at other cars that are um, available that are um, electrical, yeah. electric, electrical, who says yeah. electrical cars? <laughs> Apparently Someone Sarah Hoyles does. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. I Well, I'd be curious to see. But yeah, price point will be big, but but, I mean, but that's the case with all of them. I, I guess my point is like if, if GM or Toyota or I mean the world, like, you know, Honda, like the world's big at Mercedes Benz, like the biggest brands, uh, once they're in the game fully, you know, GM is an example I think of where they said by 2034 or whatever it is, their whole fleet's going to be EVs. Electric, yeah. Once you have the, the giants uh, really bought in big time, I'd be curious to see if Tesla can mean, like if, if it has enough of a head start that its brand will be, you know, that its brand will be, um, you know, be, be able to hold it there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, oh boy, I own an electric car and uh, I went and I was looking at all the different pieces that were available and Tesla was just not a possibility for me. So to me, it's like, how do you, who can actually afford these vehicles? So it just feels like it's more of the same (laughs) to the same people. He's catering to the same people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's take a look at our, our real talk question of the week. We asked you this week about money and politics, and this was really interesting. We had hundreds of people uh, chime in on this, and it was basically we're asking you about political donations. We're asking you about dark money. Uh, one of the reasons I think that, that this is, is especially relevant right now is, you know, our friends and our audience members in Alberta, there's going to be municipal elections going on this fall, and some of the rules have changed around money and politics. And and it's why our partners, our official research and strategy partners at Y Station pitched this theme for the question of the week. Um, The survey conducted last week, and uh, we had uh, just under 650 surveys, which which is a little lower than what we typically see. We typically see it around 1,000, which, number one, leads me to believe that maybe people weren't as interested in the subject or maybe it wasn't as on people's radar or maybe it's not a subject of burning concern. You know, if we have a question about healthcare, curriculum, coal mining, political corruption, I mean, when we had our Aloha Gates back in January, politicians traveling despite, you know, public health orders uh, against that exact uh, activity, we had over 4,000 surveys answered. So people step up big time when they're furious this leads me to believe that it's flying a little bit under the radar right now. 
conversations around money and politics. But here are some of the interesting key findings. Um, Sam, let's take a look at, at some of the graphics. These are prepared. These are, these are some of the, you know, we might call these in the newspaper business, you might call these the pull quotes, or the, these are kind of some of the interesting numbers that jumped out. Uh, in any given election, 21% of our audience members, those that responded to the survey, that would be inclined to make political donations, one in five say they'd be guided only by party affiliation. In other words, four out of five audience members that would make a political donation would, would have other factors come into play. Most notably, I would assume, probably the candidate, who the candidate is, or maybe an issues-based donation. This party's fighting against this, or this party's fighting for this, so I'll donate to that party or donate to that party's opponent. Just over 30% of our audience members that responded to this say they will make a political donation. In fact, 30 0.6%. So fewer than one in three would be inclined to make a political donation. Of those, 36% would make a federal or provincial donation, and 20% would make a municipal donation, which is kind of interesting. So, so people are less inclined to donate municipally than provincially or federally. Does that surprise you at all? I mean, it's not party related, right? Municipal is our individuals. So maybe people don't feel that they are they can't necessarily get behind that or they're not kind of primed to get behind that yeah. because it's not a party. They can't say, oh, I believe in X mandate. I believe in Y uh, platform. Yeah. Fewer than 15% of real talkers believe that unions, nonprofits or corporations should be able to make political donations. Pretty interesting. 15% believe that unions should be able to make political donations. 12% believe that nonprofits should be able to make donations. 9% believe that corporations should be able to make political donations. And, and how about this? There, there's, there, there's a real theme of, of mistrust. And Chris Henderson, the chief strategist over at Y Station, makes this note uh, in our top line reports. Our Patreon subscribers get the top line reports exclusively emailed to them every week. Um, which is, a, we think, a great perk. It gives you some real insight, uh, typically about a dozen pages or more worth of insight through all this data that's been curated. Uh, Chris points out, he says, a lot of time in these surveys, we see a lot of palpable anger directed to the current provincial government in Alberta. He, sees in, he says, in this survey, we see a lot of anger and mistrust of the political system as a whole. People don't like where the money is going, and a lot of people believe that PACs, political action committees, um, are potentially a real problem. And so th this was something that gave us a lot to think about um, as we evaluated some of those trends and took a look through it. Um, Sam, did we have any more graphics from the team at Y Station? Why don't we take a look at a couple other highlights? Look at this. 63. This is what I was referencing. 63%. Two out of three believe there's something sneaky going on with PACs, political action committees, and third-party advertisers. 86% believe that donor lists should be made public before election day. I'm among, I would be among those 86%. How about you? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if there if there's going to be money put in by whomever those lists there needs to be transparency so we can see who's backing whom. Sam, you jumped on that quick. Why do you feel so strongly about that? Uh, I just I feel like we're we're all just kind of um yeah, I, I think that there's um in in an era of of dark money in an era where um, to the average citizen, you see so many political advertisements that don't actually come from the candidates themselves. Um, that's, you know, there's so much noise kind of crowding the thing. So I think that, yeah, it, it, knowing knowing where someone's money comes from is key to whether or not they get my vote. Sarah, you've been keeping an eye on some of the other stories that are, that are making news this morning and some of the things people have been talking about over the weekend. What, what's one of the things kind of at the top of your list that you're keeping an eye on this morning? Uh, well, Connor McDavid. Yes. I mean, you can't I I no one can deny 100 points. Thank you for setting the table for this conversation, my friend. <laughs> well, you can't deny it. Being, you know, like 100 points in 53 games. That is incredible. It's it's obscene in the best way. <laughs> I feel like you probably have a lot to say on this. I don't. Well, I don't have anything to say that has not been said mm. so many times already by everybody over the course of the weekend. He is on another level. He's too good for the National Hockey League. Like this is this is what people people will say when there's a kid playing junior, for example, and they say he's too good for the league. He needs to go straight to the show 
or someone's playing in the American League and they say he's too good. He's too good for the American League. They need to find room for him on the on the big roster. Connor McDavid's too good for the big roster. He's too good for the National Hockey League. His dominance over the weekend. He needed four points in that game to to hit a hundred and fifty three. And and he went out and he had four points. Like by the time the game was halfway through, he was flying. It was Saturday night. Every NHLer wants to shine on Saturday night. He was all over the place. And I just think, uh, I mean, overshadowed by all of this is Leon Dreisaitl. Um, you know, yeah, the, the, the Deutsch, the Deutsch Dangler, five hundred career points. Yeah. Unbelievable. He's, he's like, he's not a kid. We can't call him a kid anymore, but he's young. He's still young. Leon's lighting it up. I have a question. Yeah. As a non hockey er, I mean, I enjoy, I like, as an Edmontonian, I will watch it. I will watch it when they are in the playoffs. I will, like, I, I, I like to be informed around what's going on with the Oilers. However, Connor McDavid has been with the team for a number of years. And he's been talked about as this prodigy. And yeah. I'm not, I am not diminishing. I'm not saying he's not a prodigy. So please well, don't pile technically on. Technically not a prodigy. He's, well, he's the greatest in yeah. the world. But yeah, <laughs> got it. So he can't do this. And he didn't do this in earlier years. And he can't do this with his team. And the team hasn't always been doing fantastic. Yeah. So how much does the team play into this 100 points? What a great question. If you asked him or any other mm. professional hockey player, you would get the most boring answer of all time because that's the hockey culture I was talking about earlier where he would say it has everything to do with my teammates, my team, and this is a team sport. Oh, uh, shucks. He, he, would say, the dirt. he would say the, the, the accolades are nice, but what we're doing is playing to win a Stanley Cup, and he's right about that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in, in a big way, uh, you, you can't do it without your team, but, like, he's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. So why didn't it happen earlier then? Well, what do you mean? I mean, he's he's yeah, he's won the art rock. Like he, this is a, it. It's just remarkable. Like a hundred and fifty three is is wild. I yeah. mean, averaging basically just under a two points a game. When you start getting into that rarefied air, you're talking about Wayne Gretzky. You're talking about you know Mario Lemieux, and 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 then that's about it. You start to you start talking about in good, the goal scoring greats like Mike Bossy or Alex Ovechkin or, or the, the the great defensemen like like Bobby Orr or Nicholas Lidstrom and and, and these are kind of like you start getting Connor McDavid's net is now on lists where there's only two or three or four names on the list and cool. so he it's like a whole other level but you're absolutely right I guarantee that he would trade 100 points in 53 games for a Stanley Cup a couple of months from now. Mm. Right. And and so that's why I think a lot of people are excited It's because it looks like the Oilers. I mean, it's going to be a tough year this year. Um, there's a lot of teams that could win it. But Sam, were you paying attention? Did you watch that game on Saturday night? Did you see? Were you? I, I, I had another commitment on Saturday night, so I wasn't watching the whole game live, yeah. but I kind of checked in and out on it a little bit. And it was. Yeah, it was electric. Did you pick up was, on what I was saying? Like he just he, he was buzzing like I mean, he's usually fast, but it seemed like he was like it seemed yeah. like he felt like, like tonight was the night he was going to well, get a hundred. I think it was just like he he went in with that determination like right off the bat. You know what I mean? It, it's like you, you know how players like they just they'll lace up and they were like like tonight's the night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they just they know it. They have that energy going into the game. I think that he he had that all round on Saturday night. How about the arrests down in Calgary? This was pretty high profile. Uh, Very. Yeah. I mean the Calgary police not messing around. And uh, I mean, there's there's a bit of a backstory here, but but basically what it, what it comes down to, I mean, let, let me provide some background here, unless you have it. You wanted to get into no, it. You, I, I mean, you Calgary take Police, it. basically Arthur Pavlovsky. Um, people may know the name. Uh, he's uh, well, <laughs> he he's an organizer. He's a street preacher. Um, you know, he's 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 known for for obviously damaging uh, comments, uh, homophobia included. Um, he's been refusing to abide by public health orders uh, during a Saturday church service. Uh, dozens of people, uh, you know, congregating without masks, obviously, you know, physical distancing. And so the Calgary police, uh, over the course of the weekend, um, after Alberta Health Services uh, obtained a Court of Queen's bench order on Thursday, imposing additional restrictions on organizers of protests or demonstrations the calgary police on on friday said hey listen the the court order was a significant development 
And so basically, here's how it went down. You, you know, you saw arrests over the weekend, and uh, the street preachers were 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 carted off, and and um, and it's got a lot of people talking. Uh, quite frankly, I mean, my opinion on this is uh, that it's about time, and it's good to see a lot of people are crying about freedoms. Um, but you know, we we've spent a lot of time in this show talking about what good are regulations, what good are orders, uh, legislation. If nobody's following it, they're not enforced. So. I, quite frankly, I don't really have any sympathy in this scenario. I don't know how anybody else here feels. I I think, you know, there have been rules put in place and they were being uh, ignored. They were being uh, not adhered to and they were given warnings. That to me, I think, is, is the key piece. Oh, and here we are. So this like on, uh, you know, on an off ramp heading on to Deerfoot Trail, uh, you know, this is. You know, I mean, a roadside stop, Calgary police, you know, here he is in his suit getting carted off in cuffs. This is posted by his brother on Facebook and and it's prompted, uh, you know, some people jumping to their defense and it's the typical usual suspects, um, the opportunistic rebel media founder, co-founder, I should say, Ezra Levant chiming in on this. And and uh, for anybody that hasn't seen, it, I don't talk about Ezra a lot on the show. Um, but I think that this is worth pointing out. I mean, some of these tweets, the, the, the hyperbole here and the comparisons. So here's an example. I mean, warning, you know, heavily armed Canadian police poised to attack churches. It's absolutely supercharged language. What about this one? Toronto police are hunting for Jewish children. Uh, this based on a story reported by City News in Toronto. Uh, about police enforcing public health orders around a gathering. He goes on to say, you know, basically police are are hunting for Jewish children, ordering them out of their synagogues. The media doesn't have the courage to report what's going on, says Ezra Pro Tip, check the attic, hashtag Operation Anne Frank. Very reasonable comparison from from Ezra Levant. Uh, Here's another one he put out over the weekend. First of all, Maxime Bernier, former Harper era cabinet minister, former senior cabinet minister. What a fall from grace. Maxime Bernier, now with his People's Party of Canada, says, I can't believe this is happening. You know, Pastor Pavlowski, you know, he lived under the communist regime in Poland in his youth. And today he's being arrested by a sanitary fascist regime in Canada and Alberta for holding his service. Shame. You know, meantime, Ezra goes on to say a heavily armed SWAT team just took down a Christian pastor heading home from church. Please say he's charged with inciting people to go to church. Says Ezra, this is the second pastor jailed this year. He says, we are crowdfunding the lawyers. At- oh, shoot, I accidentally cut off his website there. My Paul, Wait, how did this picture get in here? What's this picture doing of Ezra Levant and Jason Kenny barbecuing together like buddy? I'm sorry, that's weird. That that must I don't know how that that wound up in there, but kind of a, yeah, just kind of a, a kind of a weird situation down in Calgary where, where a whole bunch of people are jumping to the defense of these pastors. And, and I've always felt like if you're, if you're a minister or if you're a representative of, of, of a, a faith group, when certain people jump up and start to defend you, red flags should be waving everywhere. And this would be one of those scenarios. It's the same thing that goes with Grace Life Church west of Edmonton. Um, the, the, the reputation of that church is now established, and they'll be proud of it. I mean, they'll say, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? Absolutely nothing. Um, to me, though, when, when you find your way onto these websites and when these are the people jumping to your defense, you got real problems. Now, these the point that I think is most important to make here is that people need to start drawing lines between all these groups, and people need to start recognizing that a lot of this doesn't have a lot to do with what it appears to be on the surface. And I think uh, Calgary Mayor Nahid Nemchi definitely hit the nail on the head with exactly that point. He has uh, talked about how anti-mask rallies are thinly veiled white nationalist protests. It's, are his words. And uh, that to me is, is, it's just like calling a spade a spade. Yeah, I mean, people were losing their minds when, when Nemchi dropped the white nationalist thing, uh, that comment, especially from a mayor of a city. Um, and like you said, he's he'll say spade, spade. I haven't seen Nenshi apologize for that. Mm-mm. I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how this conversation goes uh, coming up on Wednesday, as mentioned. Um, Sarah's putting this together, a uh, conversation with the filmmakers of White Noise, um, the explosive chronicle of the rise of the alt-right, uh, which is going to be something you're not going to want to miss. I think that's going to be a fascinating 
fascinating conversation that's coming up a little bit later on this week we wanted to remind you how proud we are to be partnering with the team at the dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park now we told you how motivated they are to to let you know how much they appreciate your business and how excited they are to be partnering with the show and the feeling is mutual and and, and so mark and michael and michelle they've they've cooked up a deal that they say They say, well, this is going to cause a bit of a ripple because this deal's only available at their six locations. All right. For the rest of the month of May, they're doing a $1.99 peanut buster parfaits. A $1.99. I know. Sarah, just jump back in her. Have you ever had the peanut buster parfait? Have you ever ordered it? I haven't, but now I'm going to. Well, they're like six bucks or something like that. I don't have the exact number, but they're like six bucks. But if you mention Real Talk or Jespo... At any of the six Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, peanut buster parfaits are going to be a dollar, a dollar ninety nine. All right. Now, while you're there, consider a donation to the Stollery Children's Hospital. These six locations have donated well into the six figures. I mean, like, it's actually unbelievable. It's unbelievable what they've done for the Stollery Children's Hospital. If you're there. You can maybe take those four bucks or so you're going to save on your dollar ninety nine peanut buster parfait. Maybe send that to the Stollery Children's Hospital. Just a thought. Our thanks to Dairy Queen for their incredible partnership. The team at Friesen Brothers knows that you have a license to grill, and this is the time of year where everybody's finally getting back outside. Make sure when you visit any of their 15 locations across the province of Alberta, including that beautiful new one in Edmonton, that you check out the Smoker Favorites. That's right, Banja's Smoke Shop is one of the highlights of that entire building. Alberta beef, Alberta pork, Alberta chicken. They smoke green beans. I had Friesen Brothers smoked green beans on the weekend. Yeah, they do smoked tofu, smoked cheese. If you can dream it, they can smoke it. I've just come up with that myself. They may not stick with it, but they are Alberta grown and Alberta owned at Friesen Brothers for more than 65 years. If you can dream it, they can smoke it. That sounds more like a, a <laughs> slogan for something else, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah, which is not the game that the Fre- that Friesen Brothers is no, in. No, 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 no. No, but Banja's Smokehouse, if you've ever walked into a Friesen Brothers while they're smoking meats, tofu, cheese, green beans, or anything else, uh, it speaks for itself, and it's absolutely phenomenal we've been talking about innovators and uh i i thought that th- this was kind of an interesting angle we, d- we didn't uh, expect to talk a whole lot about elon musk today um we were about three minutes away from from launching our show and i, and I looked through the plexiglass and, and i asked you sarah did, did, did you happen to catch elon musk on snl i mean it wasn't like it wasn't like a burning question for me it wasn't like i couldn't wait to ask you I don't actually even think that there was this massive moment on the show when he was on, except for maybe when he when he acknowledged that Dogecoin might be a bit of a hustle. I thought that that was kind of the moment where I went, oh, we're going to have to keep an eye on crypto watch here and see where the value goes. But it teed up nicely conversations that we're having this month around innovation. And we told you last week that we were expecting to speak with ICU Dr. Darren Markland, um, who's, first of all, just a remarkable human. But he's been demonstrating over the course of the past year, he and his colleagues, this is, see, this is just like the Connor McDavid question. Dr. Markland would never come on the show and say, it's all me. I have innovated in this way. He's going to talk about his team and he'll be quite right to do so. And he had to postpone his interview because he's been run off his feet in the ICU, which painted a very clear picture to us of how serious things are right now when it comes to our frontline healthcare workers. We will be following up with him. He will be on this week. Friday of this week coming up, our Real Talk Roundtable, which, as you know, goes live at 11 o'clock Eastern, 9 a.m. Mountain Time, is focusing on innovators. We want to meet people who, in their own spaces, are doing an incredible job of, of taking what life is dealing them, either individually, collectively, professionally, or otherwise, finding a new angle of approach, and ultimately bettering either their service offering, the results they're delivering, or their contributions to humanity. So coming up on Wednesday, we'll talk to Dr. Darren Markland. Coming up on Friday at 9 a.m. Mountain, 11 Eastern, we have our Innovators Roundtable. And today it's a real pleasure to welcome to the program Dr. Mikolai Rashik, the founder and managing director of Miro Genomics 
Incorporated. He's one of the innovators that's featured in the May edition of Edify Edmonton. And you can check out that issue online at edifyedmonton.com. It's their innovation issue 2021. Doctor, thank you so much for making time for us this morning and, and welcome to Real Talk. How does it feel to be to be profiled and quite frankly celebrated as an innovator? Oh, uh, good morning and thank you for having me. Yeah, that was very exciting because it uh, took a long time uh, in order to get the, the publicity and get noticed because um, the technology itself is still not very, very well understood or, or known. So definitely very exciting and we're loving it as a team. I, I, I feel like uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, my mind is going to be absolutely blown and I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best to come up with questions that sound a little bit smart, but I feel like I might be out of my depth uh, because when it comes to unlocking the genome, uh, which is what you're doing, I'm going to I'm going to acknowledge I'm at a very entry level of understanding. So, can you explain to us in layperson's terms what you're doing? So then, think of your genome, which is your entirety of your DNA as a program code that runs a computer software, it's the same with you. It's a program code that runs you, literally, from day to day. It's a program code that even determines how and why we're having this conversation right now, if you will. That's how specific it is. If someone were to write it, you could create a human being, and that's what nature has done over time. And as a consequence, you can imagine there can be mistakes in that program code that will translate into impacting our health. And that's what we can look into and determine what might be your predispositions to future problems. Is this and the that's where the focus has been because that's where money has gone into understanding the genome because medical utility is the primary interest in the world uh, where the big money has gone behind it. There's many different information you could get out of your genome, so much that you wouldn't even believe, but that's where the money has gone into because that's the primary interest. How can we use this information to better our medicine? And that's exactly what has happened. I would imagine that there are, uh, okay, no, actually, this is maybe the one thing I can say definitively over the course of this entire interview, and that is there certainly are ethical issues around this, and, and I look forward to getting into those with you. Maybe some of the things on the pros and cons list that might fall onto the side of the list where we need to make sure that we're being vigilant and, and hyper aware, but why don't we talk about the pros first? If you can can unlock the genome. If you if you can map out, I mean, uh, you know, a full analysis of somebody's DNA. What are we talking about here? Are we saying you can tell me at age 25, I wish, that I'm going to see uh Alzheimer's as a part of my life by the time I'm 75, 80? I mean, is that is that the type of thing we're talking about or maybe that I might fight prostate cancer 30 years in the future? Perfect examples because you actually brought up two correct ones. That's exactly what you can find out. You can look at predisposition to both the prostate cancer as well as Alzheimer's, indeed. Now, nothing is definitive in biology. So just because you have a predisposition, that does not mean that there is a certainty that these events will occur because there's a variety of other factors that might influence what will happen to you down the road but it gives you a red flag, a warning, which means you should potentially start looking for that event happening down the road and preparing yourself in other ways. Alzheimer's is a good example because that one, that one is people are scared of because there's no treatment for that. So how do you prepare yourself if you see a genetic predisposition to that condition? But that's, that's exactly what, what it is. It's just simply another tool. Think, think of it this way. I always think of it like it's an insurance but it's not an insurance that gives you money once a problem occurs. Rather, it's an insurance that tells you what might be a problem in the future and therefore what should you do to prepare yourself against it. And there are mitigating factors. And screening is one, but if you know you have certain issues and it doesn't have to be cancer, you, you might consider adopting healthier lifestyle, which of course I would recommend for everyone, right? Uh, that's one way to, to try to fight your bad genetics. 
So it's just simply knowing what could you do up front. And you're talking about, in an example, you're relating it to yourself, right? And the older you are, the less likelihood you'll see any conditions materialize because the vast majority of health problems materialize actually in childhood. These diseases you can look for, they most of them materialize in your early childhood. But there's still some conditions that can impact adults as well. But then you can see it that if we were to screen children, the newborns, you can instantly screen for thousands of diseases in one go. Thousands. I have so many questions. Uh, com- com- coming, up in yeah. a f- coming up in a few minutes, I want to ask you about, uh, you know, uh, screening in utero versus screening of children. Um, let me clarify. Are you saying that, that if I were to be diagnosed with, with uh, ALS, for example, or if ALS was in, in the cards for me, um, I'm sorry if I'm speaking at too scientific of a level, doctor. Um, but if but if ALS was in the cards for me, are you telling me you'd be able to you'd be able to determine that when I was two years old or three years old? Depends on the condition because not all conditions are predictable from genetics because some of them will have in environmental influencing factors. So those are complex conditions, and the complex ones where there is both influence of genetics an environment, they become more difficult to predict. Now, the technology is moving in the direction where we can get some information in terms of that predictability, but that's still fairly new. Uh, and that relies on accumulating information based on, based on hundreds of mutations. Rather, current medis- medical focus on this is predicting genetic diseases where you break a gene, and as a consequence, you break certain molecular pathway inside your body, and that results in a condition. So it's much, much simpler. One gene, one disease result. That's where the focus is. So not every single condition can be predicted. Uh, cancer predisposition can be is, is a good example where, because cancer is all genetic, then, uh, then where you can see a mutation, and therefore you can in genes that are very well verified, they're very well understood as to what kind of mutations can cause cancer development. And that can give you a warning as a doctor, hey, your patient perhaps should be paying attention. So not every single condition. You you mentioned insurance earlier. Um, This is a type of insurance. An interesting point from James, who's watching now uh, on our live broadcast on YouTube, he says, now this may be developed uh, to lead to better medicine or better outcomes, but when do insurance companies enter the picture, right? And then this would be a, a very real issue for, for somebody that's got a difficult road ahead and a, 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 a sort of a, mapped, uh, a, a map of their DNA is able to indicate this. If an insurance company were to demand this as part of the robust testing that anybody who has life insurance knows what goes into it, you know, blood, urine, and everything else, um, that's got to be something you wonder if, if uh, I, I might be inherently unfair. This is one of those ethical things we got to talk about, isn't it? I'm glad you brought this up because this is really important to know for Canadians. Canada has passed a law already in 2017, which does not allow any entity, any organization to use your genetics in order to give you any product or service. So that's completely off the table, which means insurance companies cannot deny you any service on account of your genetics, which is fantastic. I absolutely love the law. I uh, was a big supporter of it. And basically, it means no worries. Genetics is not allowed for insurance companies to look at. Right now, they wouldn't even know yet how to use that predictability. We need we need many more years to understand that. But obviously this has been a huge concern in the past for Canadians. Women who were afflicted with breast cancer chose not to disclose any of the information and and take protective tests in order to protect their children. That makes no sense. You, You don't choose what genetics you're born with. And besides insurance companies already have access to the best information when it comes to predicting health outcomes, which is your medical health history. And that's how it should be. 
So I, I do personally believe that's exactly how we should leave it. Genetics should be off the table. And, and this is what insurance companies worry is that I could take that genetic information, know what disease I might have in the future, such as cancer, and then pile money into insurance vehicle in order to get payout if cancer ever develops, correct? So that's what they worry about. I and mean, I understand that, but the way I see it, I think that's great. Anyone who chooses to, to use their genetics to protect themselves down the road, well, why would they want to protect themselves to survive? So, and if as a consequence, insurance premiums were to rise, we will actually distribute it across, across entire population of Canada, which means your premium will rise insignificantly while we will protect our most vulnerable members of our society that might be, that might have, might have been born with bad genetics, if I can phrase it like that. In theory, so, I think, I think people, I think people are rightfully, uh, I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Um, people, people distrust insurance companies and people that have had personal experience with insurance companies know that, I mean, <laughs> How you know? I mean, the caps are removed, and people's auto insurance is up forty percent in Alberta this year. You know, people find insurance companies find reasons when people's basements flood or when things happen. The insurance company finds a reason why they're not going to pay it out. I'm not saying every insurance company. I'm not saying every circumstance. But if you Google problems people have had with insurance companies, I think people and and I'm not saying that you're you're not saying oh trust everybody everything's going to be fine. I can see this though being an area of great hesitation for people can you do you think that do you think that people's personal wiring and this people's cynicism yeah can you see that getting in the way of of your research being able to make the impact that you hope it makes absolutely because it's not known uh, amongst canadians that we already have a law that protects you against genetic discrimination and in canada we went from zero to hero we went from having no laws to having probably one of the best laws in the world when it comes to ensuring your your genetic information cannot be used by anyone with with the exception of course research medical research and and i believe police in case you break law <laughs> if your genetic information is available for for that purpose but otherwise no 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 business no entity can use your genetics to deny you any service or goods. And I think that's fantastic. I think that's how these genetic laws, they should be this broad to make sure that we as a population do not have to be afraid because we shouldn't be afraid based on our genetics. That's not what we choose. I didn't choose what genes I was born with. Are you, you you're in such a fascinating, I mean, you're so, your understanding of this, um, you're so far ahead of the average human being and understanding uh, where the research is at, the positive implications, some of some of the things we got to keep an eye on, the ethical issues. How would you evaluate where legislation is at? When I, when I talk to tech innovators or, or people about things like privacy uh, or sharing of information or the cloud or blockchain or all of these types of things, um, people will often note that our legislation, our government officials, typically are are a little bit behind the curve. When it comes to being able to regulate these fields, understand, yeah, having the predictive power to look ahead and understand what legislation a country might need or a province might need. How would you characterize where legislation is at on this right now? Well, hence the law that was passed in 2017, that Canada was one of the last Western countries to actually pass any law with regards to genetic discrimination and genetic information protection. So as a consequence, yes, we cut up, but you're right, where legislature will always be a bit behind. I think there might be issues down the road if we elect as a society to indeed screen all of our individuals genetically in order to progress medicine, we will have to have very stringent laws in place to make sure that government entities could not abuse that information as well. Right now, we don't have necessarily a depository of, of that information. It happens within some health services where your genetic information can, can go into medical records. Uh, police can collect your genetic information as well, but we don't have a database yet where we purposely screen all of our Albertan individuals 
in order to determine how can you protect them. So that doesn't exist. And if that were to exist, then of course, there would have to be stringent laws to ensure safety of those individuals. Because once you go into your DNA, you wouldn't believe what kind of information I could actually glean from your DNA if I had the will and resources to, to try to determine um, what can I find out. With your genetic information, let's pretend I could find out your DNA. I just took it off of a bench because you sat next to me. And I was able to look into that DNA. And if any of your relations was already on the internet with their genetic information, I'd be able to find your name. I'd be able to find your phone number. With the genetic information, and remember gene codes everything in you, there is now even a, there was a company that at least in the past offered the ability to get your image of your face based, based on your genetic information. So far, far beyond my personal interest, which is strictly medical use of it. We're, Wait, we're talking about looking, well, like I, like I mentioned, this is your personal blueprint that makes you who you are right now, right? That's who you are, how you evolve to be who you are right now from a single cell. And then how are you existing right now? That's already all encoded in there. Does this, free, I mean, you're obviously excited about this. Um, the, the, it, it's palpable. People need to read the feature in Edify, uh, talking about what you're doing and why you're doing it and what drives you. But do you ever get a little freaked out when, when you when you paint that picture of, of what people might be de- able to determine about us and what Life might look, I mean, I would love to have you around a campfire. I would love to pick your brain for 10 hours. Do you ever get freaked out? No. And the reason why is because humanity, it's humanity's will, what they choose to do with any technology. And with any technology, you can use it for a good purpose or evil purpose, correct? And I don't even focus on what might be the evil purposes of this, which is a lot of Hollywood's uh, focus, I suppose. And currently the reality does not reflect that. Right now, the primary primary interest of using DNA right now in our society is for progressing medicine. Now, um, are we going to use it in the future for some nefarious purposes? Yes, I believe it will happen. But that's just because that aspect of humanity, humanity will always try to also do some weird stuff. So are we going to do some genetic engineering? Yeah, I think that will happen, but that's not of my interest. And in fact, it already happened in 2018. We already had our first designer baby in China and it created massive ripples and condemnation from the world where a first baby was born that was genetically modified for a specific purpose. The attempt was to actually uh, remove predisposition to a disease, but it also the same gene was involved in potentially promoting your intelligence growth. So you could also argue, ah, what was this all about? The point is, is that the reaction clearly spelled out, we're not interested in that as a society. But we are highly interested in making sure ourselves and our children can be healthier, for sure. So can it be used for freaky purposes? Yeah, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if there's some dark projects already using this technology because this technology is so powerful. You can literally modify our species and and you could modify it. And and down the road, I do believe we will modify it. We're talking about maybe centuries from now we will, might become completely new species as a consequence of, of what we might do genetically. But that's not where we're at right now. Right now, we're just looking at medicine. What can, we, what can we do as doctors to help patients recover faster or make sure they don't get sick in the first place? And that's what's really exciting about genetics is the fact that it pushes the idea of preventative medicine, which is what medicine is really interested in but hasn't had much technology available or many tools available in order to execute that. And it's hope, it's hope that preventive medicine will become far more standard than it is right now as opposed to the reactive medicine that we're, we're so accustomed to. Meaning this, you only go see a doctor once you have a problem. It's, I mean, talking to you, 
I, I mean, it'd be very similar to, to, to talking to somebody about, um, you know, like a mental health, uh, like, you know, a psychologist or psychiatrist about a pre- preventative care or talking to an oncologist about preventative care. And we do really, quite frankly, generally speaking, I say this as a, a relatively uninformed lay person, but, but my observation is that we do a pretty lousy job, generally speaking, of preventative health care, of offering it. And, and, and I think that even if we were just to make the argument from a cost benefit analysis, we would realize very quickly that investment in preventative care pays off and quite frankly would probably pay off in spades. Now, let me ask mm-hmm. you this. I mean, if, if you're able to, to tell a, a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or a 21-year-old, hey, listen, you're genetically predisposed to, to, to uh, you know, you have, you have, you have a, 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 a five, you know, a 500% chance higher than your average person, for example, of contracting lung cancer, then, then if that person, you know, for example, is offered a cigarette when they're 13 behind the barn, um, they're maybe going to say, hell no, because I, I, I essentially know what's in the cards for me. They could, or, or somebody that said, you know, diabetes could be a part of your reality. Maybe they eat a little bit differently or maybe they exercise more. Now I acknowledge people are going to send me angry emails about type one and type two. And I acknowledge that as well. Not everything has to do with behavior. Not everything has to do with diet. Work with me here. I want to get into whether or not you see a difference between in utero testing and analysis and testing and analysis of of infants and toddlers, um, there are a ton of ethical issues, I would imagine, that would come alongside this debate. Can you take us into it through your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Very different worlds, though. You can see the potential value when you screen newborns, which is what we are already doing. The moment a newborn is born, you take a blood test to screen for number of different diseases, uh, metabolic diseases and so on, from the information you collect out of the blood. So we already had that program. The vast majority of the world has these type of programs and, and might be a couple dozen diseases. So there is already research going on. How valuable can it be, for example, to replace that program with genome sequencing? So because with genome sequencing right now, you can test for at least 5,000 different diseases. So just the scope is much, much bigger. And, but that's post birth. And that's to make sure you can see the body. Sometimes you cannot even see or understand the symptoms of the toddler early on, just because obviously we have a communication barrier uh, with, with a toddler versus understanding from genetics, you might appreciate, oh, these are actually, this is not just a normal toddler behavior. There is already a condition so we can intervene much, much sooner. Or you, you, and because you will know the genetic diagnosis. Now in utero, prior to birth, that's totally different. And in such circumstances, you would be using this technology because you already know there is a problem. So it would be considered to unethical to just screen, not to mention that in order to obtain the genetic information, ideally you would need to do invasive procedure, meaning you have to collect sample either from placenta or basically amniotic sac where the baby is. And these procedures carry small but very real risk to pregnancy. So you would never want to do this for screening purposes anyway, because you're introducing a certain level of risk every time you do invasive procedure. But if there's already a problem and you can find out a problem from, for example, you do ultrasound and, and you see certain abnormal features in the fetus and you would want to find out, hey, what is an issue? That can be extremely valuable because if you continue the pregnancy, it tells the doctors who will be delivering the baby what to expect and how to prepare for such a procedure. But very, very different. Here you would do it, do it seldomly whenever you encounter an, an issue and you have a very valid reasons why you need to investigate versus a newborn where you investigate for the purpose of using that information for the remainder of the, that individual's life. And that's the real power of this. You can, you can apply this technology for the rest of your life. I'm going to be honest with you. I feel like I'm at a I'm at a one out of ten level of processing the magnitude of the work you're doing and how the information could be used. 
And I bet you'd probably say you're not at a 10 out of 10 level, right? Because in, in, until it's all developed, I mean, you, you may think of applica- like, do you Are you the type, do you, do you like bo- sit up in the middle of the night and scribble things down on, an, on a notepad when you think of a new application for this? <laughs> I actually used to do that, yes. <laughs> uh, right now, focus is to really, the big focus is to ensure to develop the business uh, properly to execute what I wanted to execute, which is to bring this technology to regular doctors, which is unusual, actually, because that's what not the focus of this medical world has been. So the companies that have developed this technology, this is very entrenched in medicine already and has already revolutionized revolutionized medicine. It's just that layman audience is not aware of that. And we're a little bit behind in Canada, a little bit, but it's already, especially in cancer, or you also mentioned mental health. The, it, it really transformed medicine in, in, a, in a big way, but it has not yet translated to every doctor. All doctors pretty much know about medical DNA testing. They all know it, they just don't know how to apply it because this, is, this technology is only about 10 years old. It only came out on the market in 2007 and it has only been commercially available for medical screening purposes, as I mentioned, would be maybe since 2010 or 2011. So this is still very, very new technology. And at the time when it came out, it was exceedingly expensive as to compared to, to right now. So the next revolution that awaits us, and this is what I'm actually interested in, is to bring it to regular doctors. That's where we know the impact, true impact will be felt versus the big companies that I work with. And they they went for the low hanging fruit and they went for clinical research. So they went to hospitals and and, and so on. So we're we're still removed uh, from every doctor using it every day. And that's my dream. That's where, where I hope we we will move into. And and um, very few people actually have a grasp of this technology yet to be able to bring it to the doctors, yeah. which means that if I'm doing it here in Alberta, we're actually in a good position to, to develop it into a center of excellence that might not even be available anywhere else in the wor- world yet. Are you, a, are, you a, are you a publicly traded company? Are you a private company, Miro Genomics? What, what's the deal there? No, no, no. This is, uh, this is still a startup phase. This is still a very small company. Commercially, we're only active as of last year because it took a long time to secure contracts with the uh, big medical companies that are actually offering these tests. So don't think of me that I'm doing the tests. I'm the distributors uh, of these tests. And I offer entire catalogs. If I can go to a clinic, I can offer a doctor entire catalog of different medical tests from multiple different companies. Hmm. And... Um, but but if but if an angel investor hears this and they're looking for somewhere to park fifteen million dollars, um, are you ready to tango? Provided that they were to bring proper experience to go with that, then yeah, sure. Which means because that means um, that would be a massive rapid expansion, and that kind of rapid expansion. I haven't experienced it, so I would need someone who actually would understand what rapid expansion means and how to manage that. Properly. Yeah, we're just so we don't uh, we don't mm, misuse the resources. I'll tell you what, I I will gladly sort of step in um, as someone who will accept the fifteen million dollars for a nominal finder's fee. And then you and I can discuss how that could be best invested. What do you think? I thought I'd be more than you know what, just out of the goodness of my heart for the best of humanity, I would be willing to do that. Sure, I did okay. not expect this conversation okay. to take place. Not, <laughs> I just don't, hey, I, I have conversations like this. I was talking to somebody about geothermal energy uh, a while ago, and I got about 15 emails from people. And by the email signatures, I'm going, you know, this is crass, but I'm like, this person's got some dough, you know, based on the email signature. And they were all like, hey, tell us more about the company. Um, so I thought I could go like, Evan, Evan Solomon style, and maybe sell some art here and there, or maybe facilitate a few donations. Um, Julie Rohr, that's not a shot at Evan. I love Evan. Julie says this conversation between Jespo uh, and, and, and Miro Genomics is fascinating. 
says Julie, a dear friend of this show, especially for people like myself who live with what doctors believe is genetic disease. Julie's fighting a very, very rare disease. She says the implications for this kind of information are staggering, both in medicine and otherwise. Meantime, Greg is watching live on YouTube. He says, what about the anxiety, though, of mm-hmm. testing positive for something? Uh, maybe that's something that, not, not to your knowledge, might be turned off. He says, what if you, what if you for example you know, tested positive for Huntington's, you know, Ooh. how, how may that affect your life? Doctor, in closing, do you think most people would want this? I mean, I, I love this question. My friends and I debate it all the time. If you could know the day you're going to die, or if you could know the day you're going to die and the cause of death, would you want to know it? And it's a question that it sounds simple, but it is not a simple question. Do you think most people would want access to what you're innovating with here? So perfect example. And and indeed the answer is no. The, the society would be divided into those who would want to know and they would not be afraid and those who indeed would be too anxious. And I always say DNA testing is not for everyone. If you were to, to decode your genome and find out you have a predisposition which might or might not materialize, is it worth it for you to stress for the rest of your life? And the answer would be, of course not. So you might as well not find out. However, having said that, I would say, if you can decode your DNA and find out you have a predisposition to something where there's clear beneficial medical intervention available for you right now, in my my mind, that's always of benefit to you. But I've, of course, I've decoded my full, full genome with a local doctor here in Edmonton. And when I was going to see the results and the results, you don't get it. Your doctor gets the results because this is all clinical. I was scared because it was exactly like that. Oh my goodness. What if I were to find out like exactly like you said that that's what was going through my head. What if I find out today I have a Huntington's and it instantly changes your life. So I was scared, but I was ready for it. If, if I find out then I'm, I will take actions. What I was really scared of is that, well, I wouldn't want that, right? Because it's a problem, it's a trouble, and it's a nuisance. No one wants it, Huntington's, right? But uh, there are benefits if you find out early that sometimes people might not even think of. Number one, at the younger age, you don't have to think about your future and who will take care of you when you no longer can take care of yourself. And number two, and this is one that definitely no one thinks about, it allows me the opportunity to look for clinical trials related to my disease that might help me look for novel treatments that will not be available to anyone for many years to come, unless it's, you know, brand new mRNA vaccines. So the, the treatment might take years and years before I might hit the market. And of course, if you have no clinical symptoms, you're never going to look for any clinical trials for some disease. But if you know up front, you have a genetic predisposition, it might be of value to, to investigate. But it's definitely not for everyone so those people who know they have they're at high risk of being anxious that this this technology might not be for them indeed this is uh, i like i said this is not nearly enough time to talk to you uh this is absolutely fascinating stuff we're gonna have to make sure that we get you back when we can get people in studio uh doc you'll be right up there on the list of people we reach out to i can't wait i have so many the more that you're telling us the more questions i have which typically to me is an indicator that this is more than worthy subject matter uh, Dr. Mikhail Razek, uh, founder and managing director of Miro Genomics Incorporated. You can find them on Twitter uh, and you can find the fabulous profile on on the good doctor as an innovator uh, in this month's edition of Edify at edifyedmonton.com. Although I see right now their fabulous feature on the Japanese tart is up now. Uh, of course, there's there's more than just innovators. And in now, I, now all I'm going to be thinking about is this tart for the rest of the show. Doc, thanks for hanging out with us. This has been amazing. Thank you for having me. You bet. Again, as mentioned, we'll talk to another innovator, Dr. Darren Markland, coming up on Wednesday. And then on Friday, our Real Talk Roundtable celebrates 
innovators. We're keeping an eye on the hashtag Real Talk RJ is where I saw Julie Roar's tweet there. That hashtag is powered by the team at Park Power for more than, uh, well, coming up on 10 years. As a matter of fact, in Alberta, they've been providing services for internet, electricity, and natural gas and giving back to the communities where they live and work. You can feel good if you partner with Park Power, knowing that 10% of their profits are going to nonprofits, uh, and you can find evidence of it all over their social media. I love their Instagram. It's a great tool. Park Power, making it nice and easy for you to save 70 bucks off your first bill. When you sign up at parkpower.ca, all you do is use the promo code REALTALKRJ. That's 70 bucks off your first bill, commercial or residential. The team at Westworld is powering this studio, but you know they're not just computers. They're not just that big iMac sitting on sitting on Sam's desk there, that, that big one. It's not just the iPad. Look at that. Look at that big, sexy. And the computer's nice, too. What? The iPad, the MacBook Pro. It's 2021, Jesperson. You're not supposed to say that about your colleagues. Westworld is also big in the sound game. We've been talking a lot about Sonos. They've got JBL and Beats and all the other big brands. But Sonos is that whole home system, Wi-Fi, all-day battery life, waterproof. And quite frankly, all you really care about, it pounds. It sounds great. Daryl and his team at Westworld can hook you up from wherever via their website, westworld.ca. Speaking of the hashtag, our next guest, we, we've been looking forward to, to welcoming him to the show for a, for a long time. And, and if you've got kids in the room, you're going to want to put the earmuffs on because I mean, I, I just have to introduce Jason Kenny this way after suggesting uh, that you may want to tune in live at RyanJesperson.com today because Jason Kenny's finally making his Real Talk debut. Big Ed chimes in on Twitter and he says he says he's laughing his ass off. He says, hey, Kenny, you fucking hypocrite. I hope Jesperson devours your dumb ass. And I thought, gosh, that's an aggressive way to, to welcome a nonprofit communicator out of Richmond, Virginia, that nobody's ever even met before. Jason Kenny, I apologize for the blowtorch welcome, but thanks for making time for us today, Jason Kenny. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, you know, any, anything to, to really kind of address those, those vicious remarks that, that consistently come my way and let folks know that I'm not not such a bad guy it's 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 okay um you know maybe we can all get along still when did this all begin for you at what point did you realize that your name and your twitter handle was going to be a bit of a hot button online <laughs> well actually um I, I think the first instance of it I'd be probably almost 20 years ago um i had my name at hotmail.com and i got an email from this sweet lady who was thanking me for speaking at her church somewhere in canada um and I, that was the first inkling i had uh, and then just as time moved on and media, social media became a thing um, and, and the whole ability to communicate back and forth stuff became a thing. And I kept parking my names on things, um, just started to get chatter my way as as uh, now Premier Kenny uh, remained active politically. Um, for a while, I got heat for being, I guess, the Minister of Immigration or uh, other offices. And so um, this is kind of uh, ebbed and flowed based off of his uh, his career and uh, has, has sort of peaked recently. Um, but yeah, on, on and off, I guess, 20-ish years now, yeah. Have you been, w would you say, how would you have characterized, uh, you know, 20 years ago and, th and then even, you know, let's say two years ago uh, when the other Jason Kenny uh, was elected the Premier of Alberta, wh where was your knowledge at, you know, on a, on, a, on a scale of 1 to 10 when it comes to Canadian politics, conservative Canadian politics, and the politics of the province of Alberta, so far away from Richmond, Virginia. What was your level of understanding at? Oh, God. I mean, if I can go into the negative, um, I'll do that. I could find it on a map. Um, that was about it prior. I mean, just I, I had no no ties to, to Alberta in particular, minimal ties to Canada. Um, and so my knowledge was, was minimal. Admittedly, you know, my, my knowledge now is probably only about a three. Um, and that's really just because that's just what people make me aware of. Um, but I'm, I'm always getting more and more enlightened every day. Now you could have, you could have chosen to, to sort of let this just, you know, be it, be the type of thing that's a minor annoyance. You could have chosen to, to change your Twitter handle, you know, to, to something that would be less inflammatory, but instead you've chosen to engage. Uh, you've got a great sense of humor and it's earned you thousands of followers. Although I don't, I don't want to presume they're all from Canada. Are most of your followers from Canada? 
at this point, I think it's like 60% of them are from Canada, which okay. it's fine. I, it's, I, it, before, yes, I was much more local. Um, I was active for, actually, I was active in Virginia politics for a little bit. Uh, my previous career was doing uh, political communication work. So I wasn't entirely, you know, unfamiliar with the use of these tools in the political realm and the heat from that. Um, but yeah, the, the last few months, it's kind of blown up and it's, it's significantly more Canadian, um, which is also fun in its own right, even outside of, of any mentions of Kenny. Uh, to get any sort of interactions there and uh sometimes some good natured ribbing like when uh you know certain uh youth hockey uh, teams beat other countries teams um oh, here we go oh, here <laughs> oh here we go uh, and that's something go. else I, ne- my knowledge of hockey is also in the negative but boy will i if, if i've got a chance to make a dig i'm, I'm happy <laughs> okay. happy to do what i can <laughs> okay so have you ever spoken with or corresponded with the premier of alberta yeah um, it's been a while. I mean, he's ad- admittedly a very busy man lately, I'm sure. Um, so, but there have been instances in the past, and it's usually in the context of wrong Kenny's being tagged. And there's there's Jason Kenny's all over the place. There's one who's a, a mu- musician down in Georgia, who, again, I got like emails saying I did a great job at that open mic night at a Tasty Freeze. Um, there's a Jason Kenny, K E N N Y, in the UK who shares the name with an Olympic cyclist, Jason Kenny, K E N N Y, and they're from the same town. Uh, they get mixed up more. Um, but all of us Jason Kennys will often kind of get intertagged with one another. Uh, and he's, he's a couple of times in the past, uh, the premier's kind of chimed in and uh, uh, joined in a little bit of the fun and, and always been good natured about it, too, which is uh, which is good. Um, but not lately and, and certainly not to any sort of depth of like deep, you know, thoughts, political, philo- philosophical conversations where we uh, uh, know, know each other's souls deeply. But um <laughs> Yeah, you know, at least as much as you can on Twitter, maybe. But that's yeah. I don't know that many people have gotten there with the other Jason Kenny uh, <laughs> deep into his soul or not. So, so I'm trying. To, I was sort of trying to rank it in my mind. So, so you would say of all the Jason Kennys, you're probably the world's third most famous Jason Kenny. Would you say? I mean, Olympic cyclist is kind of yeah. Oh yeah, he's got me beat definitely. Um, I, probably. Um, and and certainly not for anything other than sharing the name with a the more famous Jason Kenny. Um, right. But yeah, I, I think, I think I could pull a, a, at least solid fourth, if not third. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to get a round table together with, with the three of you, maybe the Olympic cyclists, the premier and you, and we could see what we could do. Let's, let's take a look at some of your tweets and we pulled some highlights here. I mean, this is an amazing one. Uh, Cindy reached out to you back in January and she wondered, where are you? You know, why are you hiding Huh? Are you, are you are you tied to mummy's apron strings or are you chicken shit or maybe you have covid but for whatever reason you should resign. Can you take us into why you decided to respond by telling her you're working on your cabinet? This has been a long running joke for you. <laughs> it was just uh it, it was good timing. Um I know that there was a to do about the the cabinet and people traveling when <laughs> You really shouldn't have been traveling. I'm sorry, guys. Like, I, again, my knowledge of, of Alberta politics is is very, very minimal. No, you, you nailed those, it. Like, you nailed it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, a political view of it. It's like, come on. It, there's a plague going on. Anyways, so there was, I know there was a to-do about the cabinet. And just conveniently, we had um, I had been working on changing the hardware on my cabinets in the kitchen when people started yelling at me about my cabinets. And I didn't realize so many people were so involved in this project. So uh, happy to uh, involve others and loop them in. Um, and that turned into some fun conversations. People really enjoy. We have a very lovely toaster and a, a tea kettle combination that that a lot of people were very interested in. So um, it's nice to share that little project with the world. Let's take another look at, uh, at one of your tweets. We, we were having a lot of fun going through your entire thread here. <laughs> but a guy's like, really? Like, when did you help Albertans? Your selfish and backward attitude has brought Alberta to the back row in the country. You say, dude, I fixed my cabinet. What more do you want? This is <laughs> you you find you sort of like lower the temperature a little bit on Twitter, which not everybody's able to do. I mean, this is a special skill, Jason Kenny. Well, it's that's my my hope or my intent because it's it's always I think like, there's times where you got to walk that fine line, right? I don't want to be dismissive of people's heartfelt and very heated views of things. Um, you know, it's politics can often be a full contact sport for some folks and uh, touch near and dear on issues that are very important to people. And so I don't ever want to be dismissive of that. And there's certainly there's plenty of replies that people send things that clearly is a very serious issue and I'm, I'm not going to be glib. Um, but then there's moments like that where I'm just like, I'm sorry, but you got the wrong guy. Um, and I'll, I can kind of have a little bit of fun with it. Um, 
and yeah, like hopefully take a little air out of it. Hopefully kind of make folks take a step back and realize, okay, I guess that's a bit much, or maybe I should at least check who I'm tagging. Um, but you know, nine, nine times out of 10, I think often it's one of those just dude, take a breath, you know, take a deep breath, realize it's not that big a deal. That need to be an 11, you know, and just kind of have, have a little bit of fun with it. And, uh, um, hopefully help people kind of in, in, enjoy Twitter a little bit more because it can be a lot of doom scrolling otherwise. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah, to say the least, th this is an inappropriate question. Let me acknowledge before I ask it, I don't typically ask a guest oh. w w what their politics might look like. You mentioned you worked in politics. You've been a, a political communicator. Would you describe, are, are, are you a card carrying Republican Democrat? Where, where would you describe yourself on the political spectrum? Uh, so how to gingerly say this without upsetting everybody? <laughs> I am a, a uh, I would have a pre-Trump Republican. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's, definitely, there's a lot of uh, those. You know, yes. So the, the, the last four or five years have been very um, humbling, I guess, would be the easiest word to use for that. Uh, as, as somebody who uh, traditionally have more conservative views um, in, in certain approaches, but um, I think I, I, I tend to have a more libertarian approach of just do, do right. You know, like I, I'll do me, you do you, um, you know, I, I ultimately politics or life or anything of you. So often with politics or even morality, it's just, you know, I, I can't project, I can't expect others, uh, how they should live their lives. Um, morals and even politics, it's a me thing. I can only control myself. Um, morals are how I choose to live my life, not how I should expect you to choose your, to live yours. And my politics kind of swings the same way as long as you're doing good, as long as you're doing right. I, I tend to take the, uh, the um, I pr uh, assume uh, best intentions out of folks that, that at the end of the day, they hope they're doing good. They hope they're doing right. We all have the same ends, uh, you know, that the betterment of society, the betterment of individuals, better from our communities might have different means. Um, but I, I hope that uh, folks, no matter where they are on the political spectrum, it's, you know, not self-motivated. It's not, they're not purposefully doing terrible things um, or even accidentally doing terrible things, of course. Uh, but yeah, it's a long winded way to say my politics. Yeah. I right of center, but certainly yeah. not uh, today's um, United States right of center. I think I, you know what? I mean, Jason, you may or may not be aware of this based on the fact that, that people throw, um, you know, Alberta political news headlines and, and information in front of you all the time inadvertently. Um but there's actually kind of a parallel here. You say you're 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 a pre-Trump Republican. Um, there are a lot of people in Alberta, like I would say, probably hundreds of thousands, that would describe themselves as pre-Kenny conservatives. Um, and and I and I bet you, as a matter of fact, producer Sarah Hoyles has has got a keen eye on something. Is, is it in the live chat you're seeing? Or yeah, lots of folks are saying, yeah, exactly. I am a pre-Kenny conservative. Yeah, interesting. That that's kind of an interesting parallel storyline there. Uh, Jason, I don't know if it's a profound observation or not, but but that is a thing here in Alberta right now. I loved this tweet. Sam, can we put this one up? This was incredible. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you remember this one or not. Uh, someone says, if you disagree with someone and their first instinct is to call you a communist, you might be in Jason Kenny's Alberta. Your retort sounds like something a commie would say. We spit out our coffee over here when we saw that one. <laughs> Well, it's just, I, it, there was a time where the, the use of a word commie was absurd. Um, and so it, it harkens back to that, I think. Um, so, but no, like, again, like that, that, they teed that one up. I'm sorry. I couldn't take that shot. No, you, no, it was, it was teed up beautifully. The shot was there begging to be taken and you took it. Um, I mean, do you, do you, do you, do you, has this been a wake up call for you, even as someone who's worked in political communications about, and, and pe people are probably going to get upset at me asking you this question, um, mm -hmm. because it, it will come across as somewhat sympathetic to the other Jason Kenny. Um, he posts something on social media. People are rightfully, quite rightfully furious at him. Um, you know, mm -hmm. politics is, and can be divisive. He's not the first politician to raise the ire of the population. He's also got very strong and ardent supporters. But if you look at premier Jason Kenney's tweets and Facebook posts, typically the replies are all horrific. I mean, just horrific. Um, and, and people can debate all they want about whether or not that's the right approach to take or whether or not that's appropriate or whether or not this is indicative of a culture that chases away good people from politics, leaving only those who are willing to muck it up like this left to hold office has it influenced or even changed your perspective 
on politics, being being privy to so many tweets, like even the one I introduced you with today? <laughs> well, so not not this specifically. Um, you know, one of the reasons why uh, I guess the political work is more of kind of like my past life um, is just kind of seeing that trend continuing, uh, where the, the divisiveness is just getting it, it's just more and more polarizing and. You know, I don't know if it's it's a consequence of the media or the media is a reflection of just society or anything like that. Um, and it's only gotten worse, of course, like here in the States through through the last you know four or five years, clearly. Um, and so I, I, I sought to move away from that that work because it just it was it was in a place where I, I wasn't comfortable um, continuing to work. You know, there's there's a there's a tone, there's a message, there's a, a direction things were going that I, I wasn't willing to go myself. Uh, and certainly uh, wasn't willing to weather for my family's sake. Um, you know, I, I, personally, having done the political work, again, I've had my my character, my livelihood directly attacked, not accidentally as the other Jason Kenny, but as myself, just because of who I might have been working for, um, or or uh, who I've been perceived to have been working for. Uh, so it, it's not that much of a surprise. Um, it's it's disappointing to see it continue. Um, you know, I I think I understand. Uh, you know, the especially something like Twitter. It is a great tool for shouting into the void, uh, and sometimes the void shouts back uh, more often than not. No, and it's a great way to kind of vent and let and, and and express some things. But you know, I get concerned when when so many people throw out terms like evil um, when describing other individuals or or um, approaches to things. I think when when we so easily bandy about such strong language, um, you know, I mean, that's where it's like I've, I've got two little ones. I've got a, a six and three year old boys. And they're learning language still. And there's some words that they'll use. Hey, guys, we don't say that. Like hate and evil. And like, those are big words. Those are loaded words. They've got a lot of meaning to them. Um, but we're so quick to use it sometimes just to describe the other side of a, of a, a point of view. And we don't, there, there's a lot of opportunities for us to maybe take a step back and try to understand where somebody's coming from or pick our battles or pick our platforms. Um, if, uh, I stepped into it the other week. I, 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 I know I did. There's, you know, um, the premier put something out about, you know, about, I, th I think how they're starting to implement some, some uh, measures in Alberta to really kind of help try to stop the spread. Cause you guys got it pretty tough right now. It's COVID, really bad. Um, really comparatively. Bad. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I kind of said, Hey guy, like when, when he did a tweet thread, I think about, you know, what the measures were and why, you know, why they're being implemented. And I, I shared it and I, I kind of did a thread myself. I'm like, Hey, you know, you may think that this this is overdone. You know, you may think he's going overboard with this, and you may call this a scamdemic. It's like, well, come on, let's let's be adults here. Or you may be on the other side, and you may think that that this is um, too little, too late, or not enough, or this should have happened so long ago. Uh, but it's like, is this the time? Is this the the thread to really beat that down? Because this is the, this is a, an important thread. This is a lot of important information. It's at least something. Um, and, you know, there, there's some, you know, some folks read that. And I mean, we've said, you know, it's, I, I, again, loaded word. I said, you know, maybe pray for him if you're the praying type. And my view on prayer, it's you're not praying for somebody to say, like, I hope this individual succeeds at, at every effort and endeavor they do. No, you're hoping for guidance, for for the the better angels to succeed there, for them to make the right choices, for them to be be enlightened in a certain way. You just you, you want somebody to be the better version of themselves. That was my intent on that. But folks, right, uh, understandably, um, saw that and say, how dare you, you know, we're not going to forgive him. How dare you ask for forgiveness? How dare you, you tell, you know, who are you to mansplain to us what it is to not or to use or how to use Twitter and things like that. And I understand it. It's, it's a very, again, it's a heated issue, especially around COVID, especially people are losing loved ones. Um, and so there's really a whole lot going on that I admit, yeah, I stepped into it on that. And, um, you know, the intention wasn't to tell people to be quiet and leave, leave the premier alone. Um, but just maybe take a moment and understand that there's, there's a time and place to really be bombastic or to really fight and push back. Um, and there's sometimes where you just kind of got to acknowledge that the other side at least is doing something right. Um, even if it might not be as much as you wanted, um, because it's, it's a moment for them to learn as well. You'd hope, um, if, if, somebody is listening and, they, and you are hoping for a conversation and every time they do something, they're just getting beaten down. Well, if they can never do right by you, then they never will. Um, they may choose never to, they may never choose to uh, choose to never listen to that. And that's to your point earlier. It's not just may, necessarily maybe a, a good people won't get involved, but I think a lot of our politics has gotten to the point of, I will never please the other side. Yeah. So I will never seek compromise. Exactly. I will be nothing but just, I'm going to firebrand and, and Molotov cocktails and just 
beat, 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 beat. And it's all about owning the other side. Um, and that's, I don't like that. I mean, I, I like conversations. That's part of my, my, when I do kind of respond or involve myself, it's like, Hey, if we just talk, if we just understand that there's a human being on the other side of this and talk, maybe there's something there. Um, but again, I also, it, it, politics is life in terms of it's, it's real issues that involve real people and impact their lives. And so there's a very personal connection to a lot of the decisions that are made. And it's easy, especially for me, you know, a continent away, half a continent away in, in another country to say, oh, come on, guys, can't we all just get along? I, I, I'm not living it. I'm not feeling it. I'm, I'm feeling the pressures here in Virginia. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with this political environment, not that one. But you um, have your but so you have your own you have your own context. Um, I mean, you you describing yourself as as someone who I'm sure would love to see the Republican Party move on. From I mean, and, and it looks like I mean the whole Trump thing is, is going to continue. And as if I need to explain to you, Jason Kenny, uh, how the American machine works, but it won't be long from now before people start to see campaigning again. I mean, it's a constant cycle, right? Almost every two years, really. Oh. And, and 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 the Republican Party, in my in my humble opinion, as a Canadian and an outsider, um, is going to have to if it wants to be relevant and if it wants to be successful, it's going to have to find a way to move away from the the 75 year old former reality TV host. Right. And so you right. do have your own context. I mean, we're essentially talking about in a way with many differences, parallel storylines again. Yeah. Well, and, was, and, and the, the cycle here in Virginia, we have an election every year. Um, we, we've got gubernatorial elections this year and Trump is very much front and center that the Republican uh, nomination convention for statewide offices convention was this past weekend. They're still count tallying the votes on that. So, you know, he still weighs heavily in the politics and he will for a while. Um, but, you know, it's it's just like Trump. And I think I think even uh, maybe Kenny, to an extent, again, not not being so intimately involved in Alberta politics. It, often our, our leaders reflect our society. Um, you know, we, we get the leadership we choose. We get the leadership that we select. And yes, that person might not have been chosen by, you know, forty nine point nine 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 percent or even sometimes fifty one percent, depending on electoral college or things like that. Um but often those those leaders do reflect a certain segment, uh, a, a large enough segment in our society to get in there. And that's where, you know, again, as much as we want, may want to to target somebody like either Trump or Kenny or anybody who's in leadership, uh, but, you know, but Pelosi, Biden, I don't know, whatever side of the spectrum you fall on. Um, for a lot of people, there's that that's an embodiment of themselves or their beliefs. And so it's, it's a very personal thing. And it's in you know, I think th there's a lot of room for us to seek to understand as opposed to just simply lash out. Um, but that's tough. And especially when the other side is constantly coming at you and constantly throwing things at you, when you feel again, that you can do no right, or that other side sees you as evil, sees you as the enemy. How do you, how do you have that conversation come into that? And I think, I think the majority of folks kind of fall into that middle of, they don't view that way. They don't see that way, but they're not very loud um, because it's tough to stick your head up and not get it get it chopped off um it's tough to to have a take on something and and feel that you can express it if you don't know that somebody's going to have your back when when the folks come over you know come over the wall and and start coming at you just for having an opinion that may not be agreed upon by others um you know that's not to say there aren't some things that people say that absolutely don't deserve to be absolutely ridiculed and destroyed i mean if you've got an abhorrent view keep it to yourself. Like, I mean, or no, say it, drag it out into the sunlight so we can disinfect it and, and call it out for what it is. Yeah. Um, but when, when everything is constantly attacked when everything is constantly so polarizing, it's, it's crying wolf. I mean, you got to pick those battles. I mean, it's it, uh, from an American political perspective, there's so many things that Donald Trump was uh, particularly rightfully lambasted for in the exact same terms and language that Mitt Romney was four years prior. And you can't tell me that Romney and Donald Trump are the same guy. They only have the same politics, but the language is the same that's used. And again, the, we, the right do it to the left as well. Those are just kind of like the most most prominent examples I can throw out there. But if we keep doing that, we're never. This is just this is the way it's going to be. It's always just because push, 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 and I don't I don't know where that leads us. We had um, a. And I, is, I, sorry, Jason. I mean to interrupt. We had we had we had an interesting comment here. Um, on, uh, where is it? Shoot. I can't find it now, but, but a listener basically said, um, you know, they're concerned that, that along will come a more sophisticated Donald Trump. And that really concerns them. Although I think that maybe his, his, his lack of sophistication or how he portrays himself 
to ha- to to have a lack of sophistication was part of the magic, was part of what rallied mm-hmm. a whole bunch of the troops, was part of what gave a lot of people the sense that they had that political home within the Republican Party. That that that, that there was a comment from Haas that otherwise might might find themselves to be outside of a a traditional party membership. Um, you know, for for me, what's unignorable again, not profound. But unignorable is the fact that more than 70 million people voted for Donald Trump. Not seven, 70 plus. Right? You can't ignore that. No, absolutely not. Now, there's, there's a certain number, of course, that voted just because, you know, it's, you, it's, it, it's this, sure. that us versus them mentality. I'm not going to hold my nose and vote for a D, so I vote for Trump. That doesn't mean they like Trump, but, you know, 60% is better than 20%. Um, but I think what a lot of folks um, forget with Donald Trump was, I mean, for, for years, not only reality TV star, but he was on he was he was on wrestling every Monday night. Um, you know, he's it, it, for blue collar folks who who you know are are getting home and that's that's their soap operas and they're watching their stories. You know, Monday, Wednesday nights, whenever um, whenever it's on TV and they see Donald Trump doing that, that takes this guy who has gold plated toilets and makes him an everyman. Um, and that's you don't see a lot of that. And I think that's part of this part of it. And so, yeah, to a certain extent, you might find that more sophisticated Trump and they, they might kind of try to rise and, and do things, but it, 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 that, that, that populist kind of appeal maybe won't be there. They're too high flute and too educated. They speak too fancy. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think, I think the, the, the counter that though is it's, I don't think you stop that by 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 just by attacks, by just bash, 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 and not just him, but the individuals. And to your point, 70 million people who who it, when it becomes this us versus them, it becomes this you are either with Donald Trump or you're with us. And there is no in between. And when the with us again, I only agree with I virtual I not me personally, I but if I only agree with somebody 30 percent. I'm not going to suddenly sign on 100% to your agenda just because I don't like the guy at the top on the other side. But that's a nuance we don't hear that it takes more than, uh, you know, 280 characters in a tweet. Uh, whereas we used to say, if it doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, you're talking too long. Well, now if it doesn't fit in a tweet, we're talking too long, threaded or no. So, um, I mean, if, if I had the answers, I would certainly throw them out there. Um, you know, this is probably a lot deeper than I think anybody wanted to hear of Virginia and Jason Kenny. <laughs> I disagree. Political actually. speak, but um, I disagree. You know. We we wanted. But here's the thing: we wanted to have some fun and and laugh a little bit about some of the hand grenades that get lobbed, uh, you know, over into your neck of the woods in Richmond. Your your witty replies, your great ongoing theme about your cabinet fix. Um, but then also, we wanted to get to know you a little bit, and we wanted to pick your brain. And I was really curious. As a matter of fact, I was kind of hoping that you that you that you'd be a Republican, that you'd be a small C conservative, <laughs> that you wouldn't inherently that you wouldn't inherently. But, you know, if, if you said to me, like, I'm a Bernie Sanders guy and we you know, we need this, that and the other. Then I go, OK, I mean, some of this. But I like the fact that it's complicated and, and I like the fact that there's a lot of gray area. Um, I'm not going to get into it too much, but, you know, I mean, there's been some digging about, you know, some advertisers on this show and where else they advertise or where maybe the, the people that own the companies make political donations. And it's been really fascinating to see some people argue that because a private citizen makes a political donation to a certain party that I should not do business with their company because, again, it's team sports, right? There's 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 cults. There's there there, there are two islands with shark infested waters in between. And there's no room for conversation, let alone fraternizing with people that might not align 100 percent on political support. And I think that that's really dangerous. And I do not subscribe to that theory myself. And it's really interesting to hear where you're coming from, too. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, I think there are some of those issues where you can draw that line. You know, I mean, I think if, especially you individually, if, at, at how it impacts your life and how you feel about those things. Everybody has those red lines. Um, but when it's on everything um, and when it permeates every everything we choose to do i think we we fail to see the good in others in doing that um we there, there's uh, there, there, there's a reason why people believe what they do and see what they do and 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 are what they are um and usually it's it's not a, a ill intent um behind it um especially when it comes to politics it's you know it's either ingrained or, or environmental or raised or just faith or any number of things that drive that for them. Um, and we can't be dismissive of that because we all have our own ways of coming to our understanding of the world. We have all, all our own experiences and our own stories and our own struggles. 
um, and to to just kind of say, you know, you're either with or against ignores a lot of that and misses a lot of that. And honestly, you, you miss out on really getting to know some really great people if you're not you know, willing to open yourself up to to differing points of views. Again, you, you definitely have those red lines. You know, I'm, I'm not going to hang out with Nazis. Um, yeah. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I might hang out with somebody who I don't agree 100 percent on when it comes to taxation policy or, you know, social safety nets or things like that. I mean, like those kind of uh, policies like, hey, we can have a good, solid discussion over a beer about it and things like that. Great. But you know, it's, it's different, it's different approaches to solving, you know, ideally having this, the, you know, the, the best solution for individuals at the end of the day, which is two completely different ways of doing it. Um, but the intent is there. Uh, and otherwise somebody might be really great and, and might be somebody you do want to, and you may find you agree with, you know, 98% of the time otherwise. Um, yeah. And I, I, I'd hate to miss those opportunities. I've, 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 I've tried my best to not miss those in my life. Um, and I, I, I hope others, you know, choose not to miss those as well. I share your perspective on that. I mean, there's a bunch of people saying like, this is the adult Jason Kenny. This is the Jason Kenny Alberta needs. I mean, all these compliments, but I think this might be the highest praise uh, that I've ever seen for any guest uh, that that is appearing in the context of the political arena. This from our audience member, Hope Springs, who says, I mostly like this Jason Kenny. It's pretty solid. (laughs) Well, thank you. Yeah, that's pretty. <laughs> Isn't that solid. all we could, any of us could ask for is just mostly like. <laughs> yeah. So, so Jason, you you may not be the world's most famous Jason Kenny, but you will always be the first Jason Kenny to appear on this show, and we thank you well, for that. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm it is it is an honor. The pleasure has been all ours. That's Jason Kenny, not Alberta's premier, out of Richmond. Virginia. Jason, have a great rest of your week. Thanks for doing this. Thanks. You too. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I love it. I love that conversation. I get to check in with my team members here in just a second. But first, I want to remind you that the team at Local Waste loves to talk trash so much so that they sponsor an opportunity for you to blow off a little steam every Friday here live on the show. You can send your trash talk emails, whatever's Whatever's getting your goat, whatever's grinding your gears, send it to talk at ryanjesperson.com with trash talk in the subject line. Integrity is a core value at local waste services. So much so it's up on the wall. What does that mean? It means they're not going to try to sell your small business on the biggest possible bin, the biggest possible garbage bin or recycling bin. They're going to start your business small as your business starts small and then they grow the service provision with you. I was talking to Mikel over at Local Waste the other day and he goes, you know, air is free, but it's really expensive to dump. He says, we know small businesses don't need these massive bins. You can learn more about their corporate values and their prices by checking out localwaste.ca. Also, big shout out to the teams at Sherwood Dodge and St. Albert Dodge. We are undeniably getting into camping season and i know for a whole bunch of you you're not going to be mixing and mingling at your favorite festivals they're they're not happening again this summer and it's frustrating but it doesn't mean you're not getting outside if you're looking for something to reliably and safely pull your family's trailer the ram is the most trusted truck in alberta and the best selection of rams you're going to find it at sherwood and st albert dodge of course also all the 2021 jeeps including the highly anticipated grand wagoneer set to launch its jeeps re-entry into the luxury suv space and i know a lot of people are really excited about that you'll find them at sherwood and st albert dodge Our thanks to Jason Kenny for accepting Sarah Hoyle's invitation to join us on the show. I would say he delivered. We we, we talked a little bit about this interview ahead of time. We knew it was going to be funny. I was expecting it to be funny. He's got some great insight, too. Yeah, I really appreciated it. I mean, for being on the outside looking in, but then also having kind of an insider track because he gets tagged on all of those tweets mistakenly. So, yeah, I, I just I really appreciated his insight, his frankness, how just open he was. Oh, that was so surprising, but so delicious. I don't know. <laughs> Did you see Jeff? Uh, Jeff's suggestion here on, on our live chat. He says, you know, there's a woman named Erin O'Toole in Colorado. <laughs> I know. It's like, and where's the next? Where, like, is there a Rachel Notley? Out he, there says, he says she got a lot of congratulatory, congratulatory tweets after the conservative leader won 
that leadership race last year. He wonders, do we have any plans to interview her? Sure. I think that'd be great. When when the uh, the the Twitter Jason Kenny story started becoming a thing, Kelly and I went down the rabbit hole, and we've we've actually found another Scott Mo, who's a realtor in Vancouver, and there's another John Horgan, and I can't remember where he is, but uh, yeah, there's there's a few doppelgangers out there that get get some. Uh, Twitter love? Sure, we'll call it Twitter love from time I, to time. I think we might need to do this. We might need to do a roundtable. Or, or it, and it doesn't just have to be politics. Just do a roundtable with people who share the names of yes. celebrities and who have the better Twitter handle. Like Alberta's premier is, is at Jay Kenny. Yeah. Our guest here is at Jason Kenny, which you have to imagine the premier would have rather had when he or his team were setting up the Twitter handle. Um, I, I loved hearing, like, he's been getting this for 20 years on and off. Even to his former Jason Kenny at Hotmail.com address. Which <laughs> I was going to like, don't give that out. Now people, you're going to get even more emails now. I don't know if anybody uses Hotmail. Do people use still use Hotmail? I use it for all of the things that I sign up for. Okay. You know, you know ah, when you have to put in an email address? Because you're going to get all the junk mail you Yeah, mean. so I'm like, oh, that's going to my Hotmail account? Well, then I know that it's no good. Yeah. Ignore. Yeah. Delete. That's a great strategy. Uh, Alicia tweets, uh, This was a, that was a great interview. How wonderful to hear thoughtful, measured opinions. Thanks to Jason Kenny and thank you, Sarah, for bringing him on. I thought that that was excellent. You must have had uh, and to seek justice here again on on, on Twitter using our hashtag uh, says no room for compromise is really dangerous. I think that's great. Um, I, I I don't I don't want to get too into this, but I just say like over the weekend we've had a couple of people that have been doing some deep dives on how private Albertans have have made their 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 personal political donations. And a couple of them are prominent entrepreneurs in the province. And a couple of them own companies that advertise on this show. And people are treating it as this sort of explosive, like, well, Jesperson, where's the real talk on this? Huh? But you don't have, you can have the stones to talk about this. Where's the real talk on this? And I'm happy to talk about it. What's the question? Like, is this a show only accept advertising support from companies and corporations whose personal executives private or individual political beliefs align with mine i mean that to me is a really really strange assertion first of all and kind of a kind of a a dangerous precedent to set as well first of all nobody really knows my politics i don't talk about it a lot i'll talk about policies and politicians that drive me nuts Uh, but nobody knows my politics on purpose and second of all I've prided myself and 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 I, I've been pretty upfront and open in a magazine feature that's out this month in Edify if you want to read about my personal background. Oh Sarah, do you happen to have a copy there right in front of you that we could spontaneously display on the broadcast? Wow, that looks like a great read. The life of Ryan, fired from talk radio, Ryan Jesperson, now the Prince of Podcasting. I've been thinking of changing my Twitter bio to the Prince of Podcasting, but, I, but I'm holding tight on it for now. But in it, I talk about, and I was very open and candid uh, with Eliza Barlow, who did just an amazing job on that story. You never know how a story like that's going to work out. And she started digging into the past and like, where did it all begin? And what are your earliest memories? And when did you start caring about politics? And when did you first have your strong opinions? And she started talking about growing up in Calgary. And then we started talking about McMahon Stadium. And what were some of the, you know, what were some of the more formative memories of my childhood? And I remembered like a gray cup there. And I, I, I remembered the Olympic opening ceremonies there in 1988. I was lucky enough to be there. And I remembered the Billy Graham crusade. I have a vivid memory of being at the Billy Graham crusade when I was four years old. It's probably one of my earliest memories. Four, right? And we started talking about that. And, and I was actually thrilled with how she wrote that piece. I was a little nervous, a little bit nervous, because you never know where something like that's going to go. But the point being, I have always wanted... Now, now I'm happy to draw lines, and I, and I think that I've made that very clear. I don't think that anybody would question that. If something drives me nuts, or if I think something's unacceptable or unethical, or whatever the case may be, insulting to the electorate, um, I'll call it out, and we'll talk about it. And we talk about it here on the show. I have never been the type of person to limit my social circle, my friend group, to a criteria based on people's religious beliefs, political leanings, or otherwise. And I think that in this day and age, we see such a dangerous trend toward echo chambers, right? And and whether that's where people are sourcing their news or the opinions people are listening to, 
Um, I love that to seek justice pulled that quote out and tweeted it when there's no room for compromise is really dangerous. When we start refusing to listen to how other people feel or, or what other people believe, I think we pave a very, very dangerous path. I'm just n- nodding <laughs> furiously over here. <laughs> Would you say that you like in your group of friends or uh, I mean, even family members that you talk to? I mean, are, is there a, is there a diversity of of political opinion or, or otherwise? Yes and no. Yeah, it just I guess it depends on on where you go. Uh, there have been some troubling uh, opinions at times. And I feel- well, and that's part of the reality, too. Yes. So. I've I've had to address those to the point that I, I felt comfortable because I also felt that silence was me being not only complacent, but complicit. So that's always a struggle. Um, yeah, this is this is big, Ryan. This is really big, a big topic. So yeah, it's a huge topic. Sam, where do you land? I mean, I realize I'm asking very personal questions here. I mean, I mean, you yeah, both like, did sign up to work on a listening. show called yeah. Real Talk. <laughs> my mom is definitely listening. Oh, She's on the chat every day. So it's like, you know, that's that's not um, that's not news to me. Uh, I, I, I think the world exists in the middle. I think that um, among my peers, uh, especially people around my age or, or younger, um, that are starting to sort of form a lot of their political beliefs. I think they feel like they really need to get tugged to one side or the other. I know I've made this point before. Um, it's presented as being incredibly tribal, right? Right off the beginning. And it's, and it's, you know, there's environments that we go into particularly in post-secondary. And I can say it was one unbelievably great experience, but also like, Working on, you know, a national student press organization in post-secondary, there was a bit of a political position you were kind of expected to take. And, you know, it, it was it was really interesting uh, being a guy from Alberta going to Toronto to work on this, you know, national youth press organization. Everybody just assumed I was some card-carrying conservative because I'm from Alberta. Um, which, you know, again, these, these assumptions need to be brought down. Uh, the fact that most people exist in the middle and I think it might take a little while in your life to, to realize that like it, it, I think the hardest thing is, is to shed your, your, your conviction that you have to be on one team or the other because, you know, compromise feels like this messy word, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's where things actually get done. But, and and it doesn't even, and you're right, Sam, but it doesn't also have to be like compromise in that if you're going to be friends with somebody or play golf with somebody or walk the dog with somebody or, you know, assistant coach your kid's soccer team with somebody that you're going to have to compromise your conviction on something like, you know, federally funded childcare or tax breaks for the wealthy yeah. or marriage equality. Well, especially since like, you know, let's use the, like, what does any of that have to do with coaching youth soccer? Right. Like if you're coaching a soccer team with another person, what, what, what does any of that have to do with it? No. Uh, now. Oh, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I just the only thing that I um, just want to flag on that is that if it then like if it's about equality, if it's about equity and they're a, a coach of a, a youth soccer team and those beliefs are bleeding onto the field. Well, sure. Like when it comes to bigotry or comes to, well, yeah, then it's like, I just, I don't, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being just too blunt and too obvious, but I just want to put that out there that to me, that's, that's gone too far. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, and I, and I, and I feel like respectfully, that's not really what we're talking about. I, I, I get <laughs> Sarah I, focus. I, I, I guess what I'm talking about is that should somebody that voted for the federal liberals and somebody that voted for the federal conservatives be able to play uh, ride the same golf cart in a golf tournament. And I would hope so. Uh, now, will the person that voted for the federal conservatives um, buy in to Justin Trudeau's carbon tax by the end of the round? Or will the person that voted for the federal liberals, you know, believe that Aaron O'Toole's the better person for the job, the prime minister's office? Most likely not and probably not. Could they have a reasonable and respectful and productive conversation and maybe even take a couple of wisecracks at one another? I hope so. Mm, yes. Now, let me be clear. I've had a couple of friendships absolutely hit the ditch and completely fall apart over the past number of years. Um, But it has not been because someone voted for a certain political party. 
One of my friends is a blind and completely annoying apologist for Donald Trump. Who he's a conspiracy theorist, and he's gone off the deep end. And I and I regret the loss of our friendship, which I suspect will be permanent. And I do not take it lightly. And there's a lot that goes into that, but that's more than just the fact that he would describe himself as a conservative. I would drive, describe myself as a small P, small C, progressive conservative that is currently politically homeless. And I think that of the thousands of people that will take in today's show, downloading the podcast or watching it on YouTube or however you get it, maybe live streaming right now via the Mixler audio app, I bet you there's a lot of people right now. See how I did that? There's probably a lot of people right now that would say, I too am politically homeless. But the word conservative, especially with a small c, need not be a swear word, and others would argue, nor should be the word socialist, or nor should be the word labor, or nor should, right, or, 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 or all of the other words that can become so supercharged when we talk about politics. Like, you think of people that use socialist as a slur, mm. right, as they ride public transit or participate in our public health system or send their kids to public school. I mean, I mean, I could go for three hours right now. I won't. I, I just I want to, to call attention to your point about progressive conservative when yeah. the progressive left the name of the party. It really I mean, and maybe it's just semantics. Maybe it's well, it's just a word. But I feel like something was lost with that. Oh, huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, Jason Kenney sought the leadership of the progressive conservative party to drive it into the ditch. And he's still the leader of the progressive conservative party. I, like, like you can't right now. Actually, maybe there's some small print there that I'm forgetting about. But but all I do know is you cannot now. I could not go seek the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party of Alberta and start to kickstart it again. We could start another party or we could try to jump in on another party, Alberta party. Uh, I mean, everybody's kind of wondering what's going to go on there. Crunch time. It's crunch time because. Pretty soon, you're going to cross a bridge in time where people are going to say this next provincial election in Alberta is going to be between two parties at some point, unless people see some noise coming out of a third option or a fourth option. That is going to be the reality. But you're absolutely correct. I think that's undeniable. I mean, it was strategic and it worked. Right. And so you so you, you bring this in and the, and the progressives were when you said the progressive left, <laughs> What you you were saying that when the progressive departed that when it was taken from the name you didn't mean the progressive oh. left. It's kind of funny when you started going the progressive left. I went oh boy here we go. This sounds no, like no, no, a, no. this sounds like a speech from Alberta's premier the progressive left. But you're absolutely right. There are hundreds of thousands of progressive Albertans small p yes that right now would say I can't vote for Jason Kenney and quite frankly I can't vote for Rachel Notley or I'm not inclined to anyway right and people are going to wrestle with this. Um, Jillian says right now in our live chat, she says there are no longer progressive conservative parties in Canada. If Jillian were to lay out that argument, she'd probably find ample evidence. But I would argue that there are many progressive Canadians still. So what does the future look like for them? Kim says, I voted conservative, liberal, Alberta party and NDP. Kim is the type of person who I, this show's for. I'm like... That's the biggest compliment I can bestow upon somebody. And there's nothing wrong either if you're a partisan and you've held the same party membership for 30 years. The show is also for you. And thanks for being here. But Kim's a critical thinker and her vote is up for grabs. Those are the, the undecideds to me in political polling are always that's always the most fascinating study. The undecideds. Where are they going? She says, I'm totally nonpartisan. And she says, and I super duper love it when I'm told who I am politically. Not. She says, people are weird. Fair I enough. Super duper. I love that. Super duper. I super <laughs> duper love it when people tell me all about my own personal political views. <laughs> Shalane makes a good point, says, I'm constantly reminding my family that my pro environment stance is not anti oil. So many friends work in the oil industry, right? I mean, can you be an environmentalist and a conservative? Sure. Can you work in oil and vote for the NDP? Sure. How do you reconcile it personally? These are the conversations we want to leave a ton of space for on the show. And I'm so grateful that we can have these conversations. And I don't just say that stuff. We actually mean it. We want to have conversations that make us uncomfortable. 
that make us acknowledge that not everything's cut and dried and black and white and super duper simple to sort out. And I'm so grateful that we have an audience that's along for the ride there. Let's remind you again, we have the doc, uh, White Noise, the team behind it, coming up on Wednesday's show. You're not going to want to miss it. It's one of more than 40 feature-length docs plus 40 other short docs, many of them world premieres, global premieres right now at Northwest Fest. Uh, Of course, Real Talk, a very proud sponsor of the Global Visions film series here. You can check out all the films online and on demand. None of them in theaters this year for obvious reasons, but that's great because it means the schedule works for you whenever you want. As long as it's before May 16th, we encourage you to check out and support Northwest Fest until May 16th at northwestfest.ca. The team at Clean Air Club wants to remind you that you can save money and breathe easy. I was going to say save air. There probably are some efficiency elements to looking after your furnace, changed my furnace filter this weekend and I felt like I had like redone my roof. I was like, boy, helping the family, boy, way to go, Chespo. It took me four seconds. If you want to strike that off your to-do list, make today a productive one with virtually zero effort and do your family a favor, sign up at cleanairclub.ca. They drop the furnace filters off at your front door and you pay less than you would in the big box store. There's no catch at cleanairclub.ca. We're also so grateful to be partnered up with the team at Kubi Energy. I talked to Jake Kubiski over the weekend. Okay, short story before I actually do the spot. But you can keep this inspiring music underneath us, Sam. I don't mind. So Jake, the founder of Kubi Energy, big hunter. He's super excited for Thursday's show. We're going to be talking about hunting and the ethics of food and production and sustainability. And Sarah, you've put together two roundtables. Indeed. This is going to be amazing. And pretty much everybody you've asked has said yes, right? Yeah, there are a couple more folks coming on, but exciting stuff. We've got A-listers. We've got A-listers, and we're all going to be pushed out of our comfort zone on this conversation. I can't wait. Jake texts me, and he says, he says, front door drop off to prepare you for Thursday's talk. And he dropped off some moose meat. Jake! So we're, he's on the street and I'm standing at my front door and we're talking from like 30 feet away. And, and, and I said, you know, you got to qualify all this stuff now, right? We weren't hanging out in the hot tub together. We weren't holding hands or sharing a golf cart. But from a distance, I asked Jake, hey, how'd that go? We, we, we handed out your email address last week for resumes for, for journeyman electricians. He says, we we're blown away by the number of real talkers that applied, which is great because some of them are going to find work. It's also a bit discouraging, we acknowledge, that there's so many people looking for work right now. KubiEnergy.ca is a great place. Send them your resume, even if they're not hiring. They have teams working in Alberta and BC doing solar installs. To be clear, that job posting is closed, but you can always contact their team. Kubi Energy, Tesla certified, and of course, a great presenter every week, Mondays here on the show, of a little something we do to get our week started right, a little something we call Positive Reflections. I want to start with an email from Rebecca, who said, I'm a regular listener of the Real Talk podcast. She's listened to every single episode, but that's not even the positive reflection. Rebecca says, I wanted to write in to tell you about something really cool that happened last week. She says, everybody was talking about that big fire that happened at the long-term care center in St. Albert, Alberta. Really, really tough situation. She says, I work in the Faculty of Health and Community Studies at Norquest College, downtown Edmonton. A group of students and their instructors... Well, they heard out. They heard about this, and they were actually at the care home when the fire happened. Uh, they were the first. They were in the first clinical practicum of their program. They all stepped up and helped evacuate the residents safely. First, they took them to Costco, then to a hotel where they used bed sheets as slings to transport the patients into the beds. The students were amazing. They stepped up. They weren't rattled. When you think about it, these are young people who signed up to start a nursing program during a pandemic. So no surprise, they were amazing. Rebecca says, maybe give them a shout out. I said, gladly. Rebecca, thanks for passing that along. Absolutely amazing. What about this from Louisa who shared, hey, we'll take pictures of plants any day of the week. Louisa wrote in simply to say, I spent my Friday evening watching Real Talk and repotting a few house plants. She says, I use chopsticks as plant steaks, by the way. little pro tip for you. A pretty good evening, she says, all things considered. A shout out to my fellow Real Talkers. 
Keep up the great work. That from Louisa. To know you spent your Friday with us and houseplants, that filled my spirit, Louisa. Thank you so very much. What about this from Aaron? Aaron sh- shared a couple of really cool photos with us. Uh, by the way, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can always find Positive Reflections as a separate file on our YouTube channel if you want to see the photos we're talking about. Aaron says, despite the fact that our province has devolved into a post-truth libertarian hellscape, I take comfort in the subtle and persistent beauty that surrounds me. A loving partner, loyal pets, caring friends, and... Here's the theme, a problematic number of houseplants. All of these things require time, patience, and care to foster and grow strong. And the long-term rewards are absolutely worth it. He says, to quote Nietzsche, the most noble kind of beauty is that which does not carry us away suddenly, whose attacks are not violent or intoxicating. This kind easily awakens disgust, but rather the kind of beauty which infiltrates slowly which we carry along with us almost unnoticed and meet up with again in dreams. Finally, after it has for a long time lain modestly in our heart, it takes complete possession of us, filling our eyes with tears, our hearts with longing. Aaron wraps by reminding us community is a collaborative effort. He says you all are helping to amplify its subtle beauty. Wow. Amanda sent this tweet in, and I had to triple check the photo. She says, the world is a lot to handle right now, but every once in a while, I find a new gnome. Yeah, a garden gnome for Ken Cobley to put in his garden, despite the gnome shortage. And it's a bit easier to handle everything going on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the president and CEO of the Alberta Chambers of Commerce. Ken Cobley rocking a beard like barely anybody can. That's new. I've never seen Ken with that beard before. I absolutely love this. And the photo made our day. And finally, Sam, you know where I'm going with this video. This is going to knock your socks off. Our thanks to Tracy for sending this in. This is a video of an endoscopy nurse who's been reassigned to work in the ICU at the Ottawa Hospital Her name is Amy Lynn, and she's today's hero. Have a listen to Amy Lynn playing for patients, COVID patients, in the ICU. We're going to let this play us out today. This is a shout out to Amy Lynn and the thousands of other healthcare professionals, including those staffing ICUs across this great country. We see you. We certainly hear you. And we appreciate you. Amy Lynn will take us to black today. We'll talk to you tomorrow.